What the F am I talking about when I say the simulation theory? And offering proof that we're all in it. He's gone mad. He's lost the plot. You would say that, wouldn't you, flipping normie? You have to understand, most of these people are not ready to be unplugged. And many of them are so inert, so hopelessly dependent on the system that they will fight to protect it. Are you ready to be unplugged from the Matrix? Let's take a deep dive down the rabbit hole. Who put a rabbit hole there? This is the basic ass premise of the simulation argument. Computers can almost make a reality that is indistinguishable from our own. And now we have VR, which is almost total immersion. Indistinguishable from reality would mean that real life looks just like a video game. It would mean that you can't tell the difference between real life and a computer game. We're not there yet, but it is becoming easy to imagine a point where it's impossible to tell the difference. Now imagine just a hundred years into the future. I mean, you'll be dead, almost certainly. It's probable that a computer game will look, sound, taste, feel like real life. You're still thinking about the being dead bit, aren't you? Therefore, who's to say it hasn't already happened? That is the premise of the simulation argument. Now let's expand. The idea that the world being illusion has long been proposed by religions like Hinduism and Buddhism and more recently films like The Matrix and Inception. Some scientists reckon they can prove it scientifically. Must be true, scientists said it. In the future, it might become possible to simulate entire universes. But if this is an option, how can we know that it's not already happened? In researching for this video, I read a lot of scientific papers, and even though they're drier than stuffing five cream crackers in your mouth, I did it for you. There's been tons of tests done. I won't bore you with them, because it's literally impossible for me to tell you about them without boring you to tears. Big fat disclaimer alert. As of today's date, this is a hypothesis. You don't care about that, do you? Take the motherfucking red pill. This is my opinion. If you don't like it, what do you want to fight about it? I mean, they don't call it the simulation argument for nothing. This is a hypothesis like evolution or God or Piers Morgan or some other impossibly complicated part of life. So with that said, let's mother flipping get on with it. But here's the question. Where does this hypothesis come from? Well, it reached media attention initially when a guy called Nick Bostrom, who looks like a cross between the super brainy philosopher Alain Dubouton and a recent divorcee who only gets to see his kids once a month and is on the verge of bankruptcy. Look at these two. It's like the brainier you are, the more room your brain needs, so it pushes all your hair out. I don't have that problem. Apart from being cleverer than a brain pie, Nick spends most of his time being a professor at Oxford, but came to attention when he wrote his simulation theory in 2003, which was literally years ago. The paper, called The Simulation Argument, blew up faster than one of Elon Musk's SpaceX rockets. After the aforementioned Elon Musk, who the media rightly all get massive hard-ons for, started talking about it. Next thing you know, poor old Nick Bostrom gets wheeled out gets paraded around the Joe Rogan podcast, which is like getting to meet the queen of fucking podcasting or something. Nick looked pretty nervous, but when he saw a fellow baldy, they soon hit it off as all baldy boys do. I thought he'd never leave. Me neither. Oh, yeah. Oh, did you guys just do the thing? What then, if this is just a video game? We could just be living in a very advanced version of The Sims. The Sims 50. Which is probably why they all speak that funny language that we don't understand. It's the language of the future. Oz, Siva, Gork, Dustai, Army Bitta. Can you imagine a future not too far away where everything has been done? Every single person will be housed, fed, clothed, looked after. It's like a utopia. It will probably be very boring and very safe and there will be no danger whatsoever. But people need more than that. They need danger, excitement, thrills and chills. Otherwise it's just like going to McDonald's and having a salad. Utterly pointless. 
So if you do live in this utopian world of the future, you would jack into the Matrix. You'd strap in and live a rip-roaring life in any part of our known history, knowing that you would eventually just wake up. No other film has done more than the green-tinged killer kung fu sci-fi fantasy flick The Matrix to bring the simulation argument to public attention. In The Matrix films, AI, artificial intelligence, is a big metallic squid-looking thing that's determined to wipe out humanity for some reason. The trilogy is actually as much a warning against the dangers of AI as it is about a simulated reality, where the AI has placed all human beings inside a simulated reality so they can use them all as batteries. The shit. The Matrix is a computer-generated dream world built to keep us under control in order to change a human being into this. I mean, they obviously haven't discovered Duracell. Those things last all day. Whoa! So much power, it just keeps on going. Unbelievable, unbeatable, unstoppable. It also popularised the fact that what we call life could actually be boiled down to just lines of computer code. Some scientists, namely these nerdy science bods, have discovered when you break down atoms and other impossibly small things, like the collective intellect of the people on The Only Way is Essex, what you see is code, specifically binary code, which is code made of ones and zeros which is computer language. And it's harder to get your head around than Mandarin, which up until last week I thought was a fruit like an easy peel of orange. Listen to the virgin nerdy science bods explain it. And what I've come to understand is that there are these incredible pictures that contain all the information of a set of equations that are related to string theory. And it's even more bizarre than that because when you then try to understand these pictures, you find out that buried in them are computer codes just like the type that you find in a browser when you go surf the web. And so I'm left with the puzzle of trying to figure out whether I live in the matrix or not. <laughs> Wait, you're blowing my mind at this moment. So you're saying, are you saying your attempt to understand the fundamental operations of nature leads you to a set of equations that are indistinguishable from the equations that drive search engines and browsers on yeah, our computers? That is correct. Sure. So you're saying as you dig deeper, you find computer code writ in the fabric of the cosmos, into the equations that we want to use to describe the cosmos, yes. But we are now discovering that this reality may not be what we call real, but is in fact made up of computer code. This, this isn't real. What is real? How do you define real? If you're talking about what you can feel, what you can smell, what you can taste and see, then real is simply electrical signals interpreted by your brain. Another question the Matrix posed was, do we have free will or is our life predetermined? None of us like the idea that life may actually be predetermined, that our storyline has already been written. Do you believe in fate, Neil? No. Why not? Because I don't like the idea that I'm not in control of my life. It's like going to a restaurant and somebody ordering for you. Probably fucking soup or something. Even more evidence for this fact is that scientists have rather scarily discovered that your brain decides what you are going to do seconds before you do. Just as in Libet's original work, this experiment seems to show that my brain begins to prepare for movement long before I felt like I had consciously decided to move. A bit like this. Would you like to have a week's holiday at our facility? £2,000 you can have an entire lifetime at any point in our known history. And you'd snap it up. Just imagine you could be anyone, fact or fiction. 
You could live the entire life of Walter White in Breaking Bad. You could be Sherlock Holmes, Piers Morgan, maybe not. Hey, I'm as attached to my life as you are. I don't want to know any of this stuff. God, I even turned down Morpheus when he tried to wake me up. Do you want to know what it is? Not really, no. Um, I don't know why I'm here, to be honest. Your, your man just picked me up off the street. I have no idea what's going on. My name's not even Neo, it's Jack. This Matrix thing sounds bloody interesting, but... The Matrix is everywhere. It is all around us. Even now, in this very room. You can see it when you look out your window, or when you turn on your television. You can feel it when you go to work, when you go to church, la, la, when you pay your taxes. It is the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. What are you doing? I thought you were going to punch me then. This is your last chance. You take the blue pill, the story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want. You take the red pill. You stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. I'm just going to say now, I really don't like swallowing pills. It's just when I was a kid, I swallowed one and got stuck in my throat. And ever since then, I can't really uh, do pills. Um, it's just, if you've got like maybe a liquid version of it, of the pill, or maybe like, I don't know, at a push, a suppository. What are you looking at me like that for? Now we come to the only man with full on Asperger's to manage to reproduce and make babies. Lots of them. It's like he managed to hack into the Matrix himself, changed all his DNA and computer code so he became the sexiest, well liked man of all time. Mind you, shitload of money and fame helps. If Bill Gates or Mark Zuckerberg didn't have any money, what do you think they'd be? Musky, who manages to turn every invention he has into the best thing since the see-through toaster, read Brainy Bostrom's paper and took it upon himself to talk about it. I think his, in my mind, like the, the, the strongest argument for, the, for us being in a simulation, probably being in a simulation, I think is the following. Um, that that 40, called 40, 40 years ago, we had Pong, like two rectangles and a dot. That right. was what games were. Um, now, 40 years later, we have photorealistic 3D simulations with millions of people playing simultaneously, and it's getting better every year. Mm -hmm. And soon we'll have virt you know, virt virtual reality, we'll have augmented reality. Um, if you assume any rate of improvement at all, um, then the games will become indistinguishable from reality. Just in indistinguishable. Mm -hmm. um, e even if that rate of advancement drops by 1,000 from what it is right now. Um, then you just say, okay, well, well let's imagine it's a 10,000 years in the future, uh, which is nothing in the evolutionary scale. Um, so, um, so, so given that we're clearly on a trajectory to have games that are indistinguishable from reality, and those games could be played on any set-top box or on a PC or whatever, and there would probably be, you know, billions of such, uh, you know, computers or set-top boxes, it would seem to follow that the odds that we're in base reality is one in billions. So Tell me what's wrong with that argument. Is the answer yes? <laughs> the argument is probably. I mean, but I just like, is there, is there a flaw in that argument? I mean, someone, but someone. I'm not that, sure what but, the error. In, all right, no, no, the argument makes sense. So the assumption then is that somebody beat us to it, and this is a game. No, no, there's a one in billions chance that this is base reality. Oh, okay. What do you think? Well, I think it's one in billions. Okay. One in a billion chance that this is not a simulation. One in a billion chance that this is not a simulation. One in a billion chance that this is not a simulation. One in a billion chance that this is not a simulation. This means that it is almost a mathematical certainty, as close as you can get, that this is actually a simulation. You might be saying, oh rubbish, I don't believe that. What a load of old tosh. Okay, Karen. I don't care what you believe. I'm just telling you what the odds are. You might be thinking, oh, he's not that brainy, he's still got hair. Ah, but he didn't used to. Money, you see. Underneath that head, 
of manufactured hair is a brainy bald guy. Why should we listen to him? What has he done anyway except start an electric car company from scratch? Invented PayPal. Launching 5G satellites to bring the entire world online. Designed solar roof panels. Only a guy who launched the first private space rockets. It's making a massive tunnel underneath LA to solve the traffic problem. Of course, Karen from Hounslow doesn't think it's possible, everyone. So best we just forget about the simulation argument. If you don't believe Musky Boy, what about another media darling that they all self-flagellate over? He's another brainy guy, but like Musk, he has hair. So he's winning in all areas of life. And it's not just his head. Some of his hair took shelter under his nose. Perhaps it's a scientific experiment to see if he can filter out the bullshit better. So are we living in simulation? I find it hard to argue against that possibility. Why are we here? I don't know. Yes, thank you. There are things I don't know. Why do you go on a roller coaster? You know it's going to be scary. You do it for the thrill. I mean, I don't go on roller coasters because I hate them. But you do, don't you? What we call life is just a video game in an amusement park. Yeah, this guy's taking Roy off the grid. This guy doesn't have a social security number for Roy. This very nicely sums up the fact that life is just a bloody ride. The world is like a ride at an amusement park. And when you choose to go on it, you think it's real because that's how powerful our minds are. And the ride goes up and down and round and round. It has thrills and chills and it's very brightly colored and it's very loud and it's fun for a while. Some people have been on the ride for a long time and they begin to question, is this real or is this just a ride? And other people have remembered and they come back to us and they say, hey, don't worry, don't be afraid ever because this is just a ride. This has to be real. It's just a ride. But we always kill those good guys who try and tell us that. You ever notice that? And let the demons run amok? But it doesn't matter because it's just a ride. So. Don't worry about a thing. Just sit back, crack open a few beers, relax, and watch the show, and enjoy the fucking thing. If you think this is real life, if you think this is real life, this guide is to tell you why life is actually a video game and what this means for you as we plug in the cheat codes as I explain why you are actually living in a video game. What we call life is a big, complex, simulated game. And it looks bloody real, doesn't it? Of course it does. You don't know any different, do you? We all start with different stats that we call genetics, environment, and intelligence of the individual. For instance, if I'm born to parents who are millionaires, I have a better mark next to the resources part of my stats. But it may bring down my stat for resourcefulness because when you're poorer you have to find other ways to get by which bring your other stats up and some of us just have zero marks next to decency and decorum but our stat for not giving a fuck is also high a recent film based on a book called ready player one popularized as films often do the idea of human beings existing partially inside a video game or what we now call the metaverse in the film, they call it the Oasis because you're forced to listen to Wonderwall all day. You're my Jokes. It's a good song, though. You exist in this Oasis as a self-created avatar, which can be anything. Tall, beautiful, scary, a different sex, a different species, live action, cartoon. It's all your call. Funny, but I don't play video games that much. I broke up with my video games console, now it's my Xbox. It was nothing personal, just time for a Switch. I asked my French friend if she played video games, she said oui. But look, it's not just Ready Player One. There's loads of films and books that have popularised the idea, like The Matrix, Total Recall, and even Black Mirror. Okay, what do I do? All right, uh, they showed me in the store. You put the game chip in. Done. Now grab the disc doohickey and stick it upside the head. So brace yourself. One. Crazy. What 
the f- no. Danny! Said you gotta brace yourself. Car? Crazy shit, huh? Jokes aside, the game of life is surprisingly simple. Life is designed in a way to give you the feeling that your life is governed by a large amount of randomness. It's designed that way. Otherwise, you would start to twig that life is either predetermined or not as organic as you once thought. This randomness gives rise to most people assuming they have no control over their life. So they give in to its whims. Oh, poor me, I'm such a sad little victim. Fine, you go do that. Away from me, preferably. Life is designed to continually throw difficult and unexpected problems at you. Your challenge is to overcome them one by one, just like a video game. You have missions and parameters in which you can move and operate according to your stats. That's what makes this such an immersive bloody experience. It's funny, my girlfriend dumped me for talking too much about video games. It's a stupid thing to fall out for. When you chose to come here from wherever you were before, you may have decided on a difficulty level, hard mode or easy mode, or somewhere in the middle. If I put it simply, if you want to play on extra hard mode, then you'll probably be born into poverty and strife, disease and deprivation, which is shit. If you want to play on medium to easier mode, you'll likely be born into the West or wherever you're watching this from. But it's still not easy, you just have a different and better quality of problem. When entering the game, you need to go through a nine month spawn period, which I know sounds bloody awful, but the good thing is you don't know anything about it. It's not like you're sitting there twiddling your thumbs for nine months, getting all claustrophobic. Then you've got about 18 or so levels of tutorials that we call school before you're allowed out into the real world. The bad thing about doing those 18 years of tutorials is that you are very bloody impressionable and likely believed almost everything you were told. I mean, you rebel against this when you get to about the 13th level, but as a side effect, you become a bit of an insufferable know-it-all prick which can last well into your 20s if you're not careful. Now, welcome to level 18 or so. This is where you enter the real world. In the real world, there's two main objectives. Get money! Get money! Money! Get money! And two, get a partner. you want to know the secret source to life, the goal of life is to level up and once you overcome each challenge, yes thank you, once you overcome each challenge that you are sent, you get to play bigger levels, bigger challenges, bigger, better problems. The goal is to complete as many levels as possible and each time you do, you accrue experience points. According to Wikipedia, an experience point is a unit of measurement used in tabletop role-playing games and role-playing video games to quantify a player character's life experience and progression through the game. Then, when you die, you go back to the arcade where you see all your old mates and you all wake up and you go, bloody hell, that was for good fun, wasn't it? Yeah, that was a good old game, wasn't it? Yeah, you were my mother in that incarnation, that's funny, isn't it? Wasn't it, eh, mate? What an interesting, oh we're wearing the same shirt. Then you both look at the scoreboard to see who had the most experience points. A bit like this. Here, check this out. Morty, you, you kind of wasted your 30s though with that whole bird watching phase. Where, where's my wife? Morty, you were just playing a game. It's called Roy. Snap out of it. Come on. I'm. I mean, for God's sake, look how far we've come already with technology. If you don't believe in the simulation theory, that's fine. See my other video where we proved it. And answering some questions that Stephen Hawking asked actually over 50 years ago, we've come to the conclusion, and I'll just say it out loud and then I'll stop, that we might be holograms that the universe might not be at all the way that we perceive it to You're be. You're blowing my mind now, you see. Look what mobile phones used to be just 20 years ago. Good looking, stylish, 
very slim. Phenomenal memory, 22 hours staying power, and many, many other attractive features. The phone! I am, of course, referring to the amazing PP800. It's only 19.99, and it's exclusive to people's phone. Not only that, what about computers? Look how shit this looks. Eva, you wouldn't catch me going up there. Tap Teva. It's whatever you want. However, whenever, why ever you want it. It's the new PC. Ah, Aptiva from IBM. I like old adverts though. It's like getting wrapped up in a big, lovely nostalgia blanket. And with the improvements of AI, VR, and the singularity, we should have a fully functioning metaverse by about 2050 or bloody sooner, I hope. I would actually like to be around to flip and see it. Now, the next stage will be creating a reality that is indistinguishable to this world. Looks real, doesn't it? Well, it's not. Now think about what it will look like in 30 years. My theory is that up there in heaven or wherever we came from, before you enter into the game, you can map out an entire lifetime and then you enter into the game and play it out as the main character. The fun will come in writing this life as much as living it like a screenplay that you will enter into and play as the main character. The next stage will be to forget who you are and play the entire lifetime out forgetting who and what you are. Because life doesn't really work if you know it's all just a bloody game. Or you could say, I want to be Harry Potter and live an entire lifetime as a scrawny specky little git if you insist. Or you could be another clever specky git like Walter White, you could be him. You put the VR headset on, load up Breaking Bad, take your amnesia pill, and live his entire lifetime in one night. A bit like this. Who the hell are you? You all know exactly who I am. I don't, I don't have a damn clue who the hell you are. Yeah, you do. I'm the cook. I'm the man who killed Gus Fring. Bullshit. Cartel got Fring. You sure? That's right. Now, say my name. Eisenberg. You're goddamn right. What happens when your player, avatar, whatever, dies? Some people think there's nothing. Others think you respawn. More others think you stay as your character, but go to a better, brighter map. But only if you were good. Hello God, you alright mate? Have I been a good boy? The idea that your player will die is a horrible one, because over time you can grow very attached to it and would miss its experiences. This is pure speculation, but it's my hypothesis that we are actually living in the future where everything has been done and all our needs are met. So, with all the problems removed from our life, thus, it's very boring. So, we strap in and enter another world, which we enter through a veil of amnesia. So we forget why we came here into a world full of struggle and challenge where we must fight to survive against evil antagonists who themselves are also playing the game. Because every single film or video game has an antagonist. That's someone who's being evil. It's a necessary evil. It gives you something to fight against. Otherwise you just sit around in the Garden of Eden all day trying to find a new leaf to cover your privates. Still don't believe me? Well, why do you play video games? For fun, I hear you say. Yes, because most of the problems have been removed from our lives. Food, sorted. Too much of anything. Money. If you're watching this, you're likely comfortable-ish. Or you are at least in the top 5 to 10% of the world's richest people. So you have shelter, a phone, electricity, the internet. So things are kind of sorted for you. And so, you need to enter a world to experience the problems that you cannot, to challenge and further yourself virtually. We are all players in this big video game, and I don't blame you for thinking I'm talking bollocks, because it looks and feels so goddamn real. But what is real? Do we have a deal? 
Mr. Reagan. You know, I know this steak doesn't game. The game we call life is a constant struggle to overcome an endless supply of problems. Which come in all shapes and sizes. The poor have problems, the rich have problems. You can level up and get a better quality of problem, but you will always have problems. The game we call life is a constant struggle to overcome an endless supply of problems. Problems are what keep us occupied and give our life meaning and are necessary to leveling up. Problems are the game of life's currency and you have two choices when you face a problem. Number one, face it head on, come up with solutions. This is how you level up. Or number two, distract yourself from the problem. The latter can be very, very fun, but not as rewarding. Distraction is another word for procrastination. And all of us fall prey to this by doing literally anything except the task at hand. Drinking, shagging, trolling James Corden online because he's a fat idiot. Anything really to dull the pain of the problem. It's like being given a mission on Grand Theft Auto and then going straight to the titty bar, which you've done, haven't you? Distraction keeps us from levelling up. If our distraction becomes a habit, we get stuck on the level. And as humans, we commonly refer to this as being stuck in a rut. And you probably won't even know it because you're so hopelessly inured by the system that you carry on distracting yourself, never realising your potential as the kick-ass, mother-flipping, greatest goddamn player you could have flipping been. So how do you become the best character in a video game? You put the hours in. You learn, grow, overcome missions, beat the boss levels, and complete all the side missions. The formula for winning at life is to correctly identify your distraction and eliminate them and focus on the solutions to your problems. It's not sexy, it's not as much fun as going to the titty bar, but it will help you level up. Play a video game. <laughs> Just because you level up doesn't mean you have no more problems, just a better quality of problem. For instance, if you become a millionaire, you lucky bastard, you're going to need to invest that or the tax man is going to come and swipe his half. Better quality of problem, but a problem nonetheless. Where do you invest and what in? Is it trustworthy? Stocks? Property? Who do you trust with it? Will I lose it all? Here's a cheat code that you can use right now. Take responsibility for everything in your control. Confront every problem that you have face first. You'll be surprised what you can overcome with just this alone. Cheat code two, write down and journal your problems. It's surprisingly difficult. So you're gonna need to know what you're distracting yourself with and what are you avoiding. I know it's sexy to pop pills and drink and chase birds or men if you're a bird and drink and go to therapy and play video games all day. But just the simple action of writing shit down allows you to realise what's important to you and make a bloody plan for getting it. Here's another. But I need my fags, drink, pills, whatever. What's the hell me playing video games all day? I need to overwork all day so I can do a job, earn loads of money, get a hot wife to impress everybody. These are the excuses I can hear dripping out of you and I'm the other side of the screen. That little voice in your head that's making excuses is the grooves in the record of the habit that is calling you back to distraction. Stop making excuses, you whiny little bitch. Stop fantasizing or daydreaming about what could be. Fantasizing about being a pop star, rock star, or Hollywood bloody film star. Playing in front of a massive crowd is bloody tantalizing, but it doesn't help you. I know you do it though, don't you? Well, cut it out. It's another form of distraction. It creates an alternative reality where you are the star and all those who have wronged you get to see what a genius you are and how they're eating their words now, eh? Yeah, I'm dead now. Yeah. I'm Kevin! Kevin! Tea's ready! 
Fantasizing is a way of getting some accomplishment while laying in bed. That's some achievement and not a good one. Listen, I get it, life's hard. Do you really think I wanna spend most of my day writing, filming, and editing? It takes me days, sometimes weeks, numerous hours of hard, intense work to make these videos for you, for free, when I could be playing video games. Why? Well, firstly, I enjoy it. Second, I'm leveling up by making stuff. My videos are getting objectively better. And thirdly, because I'm the wisest motherfucker this side of the Atlantic. And I think it's best I share that with the world. Someone who is a maverick, someone who does that to the system. Listen, use fantasies sparingly. They can be useful, but it's like smoking crack. Tell you what, that crack is really Moorish. Go play a video game. Why is life so hard? The game of life is pretty hard. You already know that. So many things in life are like a mirage. You think you found the answer to something, and then just as you get to it after putting in all that hard work, it disappears and you feel like crying. That was the answer to all my pain and problems, you say. That person I wanted to go out with. That thing that was gonna make me loads of money and solve all my problems. That's why you came here, Earth. Because it's hard. Where you really come from, life is too bloody easy. That's why you're here to learn. Even if you become a millionaire, still a shortcut, there are certain things you just can't shortcut in this game. It's like rushing through the game to get to the final boss level. You've missed all of the side missions, and you've only completed about 50% of the game. But remember, the goal of life is not to win, but to learn, and to build up as many experience points as you can through facing the trials and tribulations of being a human being via the numerous problems that you will face. The better you get smashing through your problem, the more you level up and the more experience points you get. But unlike a computer game, you don't complete it and then you die. You die, then you are completed. Your avatar dies, but you carry on. Take off the headset. Go back up there in the heavens or 100 years into the future or wherever you really are or came from. Bringing with you that full lifetime of experiences to carry with you. As Shakespeare said, all the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players. Good luck, player one. life a video game within a video game within a video game Ooh. inception -y. the idea that we're living inside a simulation ain't new and i've made it the main focus of this channel which is why i bleat on about it endlessly like a broken record of a broken record where i feel like i talk about it more than a priest does about how great jesus was all religions around the world say that this world was created by a creator you know a god like me Hi girls, calm down, calm down. An omnipotent deity who formed the world in seven days. Apparently, anyway. But I bet he had a load of staff to cook his dinners and wash his clothes, didn't he? But religion is simply another way of framing the idea that life is a video game. In this video, I'm going to prove with great humour and wit, pulling out all the bells and whistles on this mental roller coaster of flashing lights, loud noises, constant bombardments of madness, news and a few laughs along the way. Life is a video game within a video game within a video game. Of the 7.4 billion people on this planet, only 1.2 bill are non-religious or atheist at prox. So, we're a dying breed. In other words, 80% of people in the world are comfortable with the idea of the world being created by God and ourselves as little temporary characters waiting to transition to a better world. A bloody hope. I don't have to keep coming back here to this bloody world, lifetime after lifetime. God, this game's harder than Rhino's horn up your back end. Some religions take this further with concepts of respawning, i.e. reincarnation, which might depend on one's performance through life and the points that you accrue could be karma, which accumulates over each iteration of you in each character. This is Buddhism, if you don't know. Must be rubbish having a birthday round a load of Zen masters. What present do they get here? Nothing! Here's a present. It's the present moment. That's even more annoying than when I email my Zen master. He wouldn't accept attachments.
we are familiar with simulations from popular films like The Matrix, Tron, Free Guy, Ready Player One and TV shows like Black Mirror. And Inception which is about a dream within a dream within a dream. Which is a good example of a recursive simulation, i.e. a game within a game within a game. And Yeti. These films are like little dainty reflections in a little fairy's mirror compared to the power and reach of future video games. Cause with the explosion of video games in the last bunch of years, video game developers can invest loads of money into the creation of bull busting new games. Don't believe me. Here's a factoid for you. In its first three days on the shelf, Grand Theft Auto V made $1 billion. Numbers on its opening night, worldwide sales top $800 million. That's one night, easily blowing away all expectations and is now on its way to taking over the world's highest grossing entertainment vehicle ever. Bigger than movies, sporting events and concerts in three days. That game was released in 2013. That's eight years ago. There you go, I've just done all the maths for you. So these companies have insane amounts of cash that film companies could only dream of having to invest in making lifelike worlds. And many are approaching truly lifelike realism with massive multiplayer options and going into VR. That's what I'm waiting for, VR on a PS5. Ooh yeah. I would tell you a joke about the PS5, but you probably won't get it. For these games to succeed though, in the punishing world of reviews and high standards, the games have got to be insanely great. Why? It must offer something that every person wants. Escapism. I mean, we all need to take a break from ourselves now and again. Because it gets boring being a normal little pleb, I imagine. That's why film and TV is so popular. We can temporarily live through other people's lives. Video games are the same. In the future, escapism will only become more necessary. Let me explain why. And if we take a look at the most successful open world video game franchises, Assassin's Creed, GTA, Red Dead Redemption, ETC, we notice that their worlds are built in our image. They resemble our earthly environment. A bit like the Bible says, in it. These video games offer a simplified, distilled representation of reality, i.e. the best bits, while cleverly appealing to our most primordial desires for violence and entertainment. What do you bloody say? Yeah, like shoot a person's face off. And it's addictive. Loads of people whinge in the comments of my video saying, I don't like it here. But exactly the same reason that you play video games for the escapism and the addictive elements is exactly the same reason the real you is playing as you in this video game. To the real you, this place is more addictive than a rucksack full of crack. Many games are recursive. What the flip does that mean? It means that we can play a game within a game. If this is a simulation, which it is, there's a chance that when we exit or die, it will be an exit into another simulation. Cause if this life is a video game, and at this moment, there are hundreds of thousands of people working on making realistic and captivating video games, trying to replicate our reality. We're likely soon to be able to enter and play a new, better reality created by us. Which I call better than life. Which distills the most entertaining parts of this life into an immersive experience. This will be achieved in our lifetimes. Think of GTA. You go around stealing cars, committing crimes, doing missions and slapping strippers. You basically do what the fudge you want. Something you can't do in this world. Well, I suppose you can, but it won't go down very well. There has never been a better time to be alive. Our grandparents witnessed the transition from horse and carts to cars, jumbo jets and the fidget spinner. We are likely to see a transition from this reality to a new one, a video game that we all live inside. At the same time, present and future generations will probably experience substantially longer lifetimes through like, you know, science and stuff. So if the world's population is living longer, and many of today's jobs are gonna be replaced by artificial intelligence and machines, the extra time available to humans must be spent somewhere, somehow. No, you can't just sit around all day. So, is life a video game inside a video game inside a video game? Well, it's entirely possible, if not probable. Let me make it more simple than a Rubik's Cube with one colour. One day, when you die, you will end your go. Don't cry, girls. Even a god like me is going to die one day. And you will wake up somewhere else. You take off the headset and sit up, seeing a futuristic, utopian-type world. 
You might be thinking that this is base reality, that this is where the real you resides. But actually, it's more than likely that the utopian world you find yourself in is actually also a simulation. When that version of you dies at the age of, say, 300, the player playing it wakes up in an even more advanced utopian world. And so on. Until at some level, we reach the real, real you. Which is what we would call God. Who then, we could say, is playing as every single one of us. You, me, our mums and dads, aunts and uncles, brothers and sisters, cousins, grandmas and granddads, and everyone that came before us. God, or the infinite player, was so bored on its own, it created this world, as it says in every religion. It created simulations within simulations, video games within video games, forgetting who it was so it has someone to play with, itself. The universe is God, the infinite player, experiencing itself subjectively through every one of us, through countless simulations, or games, or multiverses, or metaverses, or dimensions, or whatever you want to call it. You are the universe pretending to be human inside a video game, inside a video game, inside a video game. I'm going to tell you, lucky bastard, people, the secret speed that this simulation runs at that no one else has realised or knows. Knowing the speed is like being able to see the walls of the hologram or know the refresh rate of this virtual reality that you and I exist inside. And I'm going to take you on such an illuminating journey of discovery that you'll probably shit your pants. So pack some spare ones before we set off. Ready? You might be thinking, what's the point? Why do I need to know the speed of the simulation? Because it's another key to unlocking and hacking this simulation. Collecting all the keys by watching all my videos will give you every key you need to hack the matrix. So, what is the speed of the simulation? The speed of the video game that we're all inside. I read this book written by a computer geek who has no idea how to translate difficult subjects into easy to read and fun ways. Probably a virgin as well. The science on this is so boring and hard to understand and I won't bore you with it because you'll just switch off, won't you? And I don't want that. I want you to watch till the end where I've placed an easter egg. No, not a chocolate egg, you nincompoop. A video game easter egg. A secret hidden code. And you can't skip to the end to see it, because it won't make any sense. LOL! Collect all my easter eggs and you could win a very special prize. So, you want to know the speed of this simulation. 186,000 miles per second. To put that into perspective, light from the moon takes 1.3 seconds to arrive on Earth. I bet you could also probably see James Corden on the moon if we blasted him up there. Now that would be brilliant. 186,000 miles per second, which is the same as the speed of light. Coincidence? That's because that number is the speed of light. The walls of the simulation is the speed of light. So if you don't blink for ages, you can see it. If we do live inside a giant video game, and we exist in what you could effectively call a virtual reality holographic world where the things in our immediate environment are rendered by our own headsets in base reality. Rendering just our field of view exactly like a virtual reality game. Then my maybe fudged up reasoning is the speed of light is the speed that the simulation runs at. And because holograms are made of light, the speed of the simulation is a fundamental unbreakable law of this reality exactly like a virtual reality game. But is the speed of light the speed of the simulation? Is that why it's impossible to travel any faster than the speed of light? According to Einstein's general theory of relativity, it's physically impossible for anything to travel faster than the speed of light. As an object approaches the speed of light, the object's mass becomes infinite and so does the energy required to move it. That means it is impossible for any matter to go faster than the light travels. So, the programmers of this video game do not want us to go any faster than the speed of light. Cool! I wonder what would happen if we actually hit the speed of light. I reckon the walls of this simulation would break down and we'd be able to see the programmers looking down at us through the clouds. Mmm. Even the American science darling, 
who I think, ironically, sounds like a pissed version of Woody from Toy Story. Which is ironic, because he's an astrophysicist, he would be more suited to being Buzz Lightyear. Anyway, he said the same thing in a recent podcast. Maybe that's why we can't travel faster than the speed of light. Because if we could, we'd be able to get to another galaxy before they could program, they could program oh! that galaxy. Oh! Oh! <laughs> <laughs> So much fun. Oh. oh, so the programmer put in that limit. Put in the limit. Because that's Speed the fastest they can that's get. A, we can't, we can't oh. program fast oh. enough. Oh. So we put in Chuck. a limiter. The speed of light is a limiter so that you can't get to the next thing before we build it. How interesting. The speed of light could be the universal speed limit and could be the speed limit that the programmers of this simulation put in. Because if we could travel any faster than the speed of light, we could reach a part of the universe that hasn't been programmed yet. The speed of light could be the number made by the programmers of the simulation that we live in. And we can't go any faster than the speed of light because the computer in base reality can't process the information faster than that. Apparently, when you do start approaching anywhere near the speed of light, strange, odd and weird things start happening. The speed of light is a constraint of our physical reality or the physics engine that this simulation is using to render the world around us. Like a virtual reality game. I recently played an Oculus Quest 2 playing Pistol Whip. When I first put the headset on, it completely fooled my senses into believing that I was standing on a ledge looking out across this strange world. And I couldn't help but laugh because it was amazing. It's the first time that a video game has felt fully immersive in the sense that while playing the game and dodging bullets, I could feel a visceral gut feeling of dread when a bullet hit me or I face slammed into the wall or felt like I was about to fall off the edge. I would get that stomach flip like this. What's that swinging in the wind? Mom, look around. No, this is gonna make me sick. <laughs> The light inside the VR headset has to be fast enough. We call this the refresh rate to fool our eyes into the object looking solid. If our 3D reality is actually a virtual reality construction, then what we think of as physical space and time is just a virtual construction. Just like the world inside that Oculus Quest, it was virtual and yet it still fooled my senses. We are probably inside a virtual reality world that we fully entered by choosing to forget who we were, to fully immerse ourselves in this world as someone new. And the speed of light is probably the speed of the virtual reality video game that we call life. This video is a ball buster. A recent comment on one of my videos makes my brain harder than watching an episode of The Late Late Show with James Corden. How is this guy on the telly? The comment said, what if the only participant player in the simulation is you and the rest of the world is filled with fake NPCs? OMG! I think we might have broken a simulation with this one. Perhaps they'll turn this whole video game off. If we do actually discover that we're in their simulation. Perhaps that's why there's men in black watching my house. Is there any validity to this seemingly outlandish claim? I put on my best Sherlock Holmes hat. I don't have a deer stalker hat. All right. Anyway, it's a myth that Sherlock Holmes wore a deer stalker. Google it. And started investigating whether this world is actually, truly, 100% populated with NPCs. And what I discovered is going to chill you to the bone so much you're going to need to stand next to a very hot radiator for ages. Without further ado, no, that's not a Shakespeare quote. Let's break down bit by bit this possibly impossible conundrum of is this person right about NPCs? Quote, what if the only participant or player in this world is you, a fake world filled with NPCs and storylines as part of your experience. When you're not looking, nothing exists. Scenery only renders when you look at it. It's all an illusion. The lives you see of friends, family, celebrities, politicians only merely exist as a construct to add legitimacy to your world. And when you're not there, they don't exist. When you sleep, the lights go out. The game is on standby. While you sleep, you experience other simulations, commonly referred to as dreams. End quote. If this is true, and you are the only real player, and everyone else is an NPC, it would mean that this life 
if it is a video game, which it is, would be like a AAA rated title where you are the main player and everyone else is a part of your story. The smarter the NPCs, the more realistic and immersive the story. Just like a AAA rated video game like Uncharted, Red Dead or GTA. Stay tuned as we dive deeper than a broken submarine. There are times, like at the moment, when I think the world is a right shithole. I'll be completely honest with you. I get down sometimes, you know, when certain things don't go to plan or don't work out in the way that I want them to. I usually go for a walk every day, like a dog. And because I'm so intelligent and charming and have a higher IQ than every single university student combined, which I admit is not that high, I think to myself, these people around me look thick. I mean, they're loud, they're annoying, they get in the bloody way, they sound dumb, and they've got absolutely bloody nothing to tell me that would interest me in any way. And I think, you're all NPCs, sent here to make my life a fudging misery. But, with all that said and done, without them, it would make this whole game pretty dumb boring. So, with that motivational speech out of the way, let's continue to point one. One, what if the only participant player in the simulation is you, a fake world filled with NPCs and storylines as a part of your experience. When you're not looking, nothing exists. What if you are the only actual player in this entire video game? Are some of us real players and all the others are NPCs? If there are billions of simulated universes, there are probably trillions and trillions of simulated conscious beings which would mean that the vast majority of all conscious beings that will ever have existed are simulated. So for every conscious being made of flesh, a billion simulated ones exist. How could we possibly tell? Unfortunately, we can't just slice them open to see the wires all poking out of them. No, because then we'd be in bloody prison, wouldn't we? Perhaps we could get some special sunglasses, like in that film, They Live, which would allow us to spot them. But no one would actually ever admit to being an NPC. Their AI code wouldn't let them, let alone their ego. I mean, I don't know, you tell me. And it's easy to look at some people and judge because they're a trash man or a shopkeeper or just an idiotic boob. And think to yourself, they must be an NPC. They're bloody idiots. And maybe, just maybe, they are. Two. What if you are real and everyone else is an NPC? And it's hard to wrap your head around because you are you thinking your thoughts and I am thinking my thoughts. And it doesn't quite compute in our tiny chimp skulls, does it? Because how can I be the only real player? I talk to friends and family and they seem uber uber real. Some of them anyway. Now, I don't play video games much. I don't have time in between work and making these videos. I am tempted to buy an Oculus Quest and play that. Inside a VR game, you slash and shoot your way through thousands of non-player characters. You are the only real player and they are all NPCs. Is this world any different? We don't go blasting our way through people at the corner shop with lightsabers, do we? Even though it would be bloody convenient. Three. Scenery only renders when you look at it. It's all an illusion. To understand how this simulation is rendered, we need to look at video games. In video games, the computer doesn't render all of the world at once. That would be more mental than Mad Mickey Madhouse, the maddest madman in all of Mad Town. It only renders a tiny part of the world that you can actually see, usually shown on the map HUD. That's how it can save most of its processing power. No point rendering something that isn't there. Inside your VR headset, it only renders your field of view. The mountains in the distance look 3D, but that's an illusion. It's actually 2D. Four. The lives you see of friends, family, celebrities, politicians only merely exist as a construct to add legitimacy to your world. When you're not there, they don't exist. The world needs conscious observers. That means you and me existing and looking at it for it to be real. Far from being organic material, this universe is very likely to be electrical. I caught my godson chewing on some electrical wires the other day, so I had to ground him. He's doing better currently and conducting himself properly. We just got our wires crossed. I think he was just a bit shocked. Without the world being observed, it's nothing. Think of a video game with no players. 
Does it exist? It exists as potential. As in, it's a thing that could be played and experienced, but is only real when observed. Christ, I'm clever. Breaking down all this complicated stuff for you into a nice, easy, bite-sized, non-sciencey, entertaining, non-waffly. Ooh, waffles! I bloody love waffles. Of course I do. Look at me. All bomb paid for. I don't really like to think of my friends and family as being NPCs. Like Elon Musk says, I'd rather be optimistic and wrong than pessimistic and right. Five. When you sleep, the lights go out. The game is on standby. You cease to observe the world. Therefore, it is not being rendered. It's only rendered when you look at it with your eyeballs, which are like Oculus lenses into this world. If you've logged out of the game, you aren't experiencing it. Six. While you sleep, you experience some other simulations which are commonly referred to as dreams. If you think about it, dreams are funny, aren't they? You go to sleep and play through these weird scenarios that make no sense. The same rules don't apply. Like I used to have a recurring dream where I could fly. At random moments, to fly, I'd have to pedal like I was on a bicycle. And then fall and smash me face in the ground. Except for the fact that it was made of marshmallows. And then I picked up a massive five kilogram marshmallow and ate the whole lot. But suspiciously, when I woke up, my pillow was gone. Are you the only real player and everyone else in your experience is an NPC? My gut instinct says and that's not to say NPCs don't exist. Maybe they do. But I'd rather be optimistic and wrong. I don't want you to be NPCs. Or perhaps this is the most NPC thing I could have said. You've seen my video giving you the proof that we're all in the Matrix. And you've seen my video giving you the proof that life is a video game. Now, let me give you the proof that life is actually an MMORPG video game. Holy fudge! Whoa. Nice. Life is an MMORPG video game. I'm going to take a wild guess and say that you play video games. But there is a game that we all play. A game that we all have a character in. Whether we like it or not. Yes. I'm talking about life. The extra hard setting, sandbox, permadeath, MMORPG that we're all forced to play. It's pay to win. A grinding, hustling and exhausting ride. The tutorial takes ages. It sucks when you're doing it, but you miss it when you finish it. And there's so many stats to build up, a lot of players just leave it on autoplay. It's a dizzying, distracting, colourful, blinding ride of dopamine-filled, drug-fueled, revelling revelations, epiphanies and disasters. Welcome to life, the human being experience. What the heck does MMORPG mean? Anyone that plays video games knows that MMORPG is short for Massively Multiplayer Online Role-Playing Video Game. Let me just break that down for you. Massively. Life is massive. There's over 7 billion players in this metaverse and growing, so it's very popular. Multiplayer. It is a multiplayer game. We're all hooked up, competing against each other in this experience of a lifetime as a human being on planet Earth in the year 2021. Online. It's just like an online video game where you play against other players from all over the world. Similarly, the thing playing as us could be jacking in from all over their known universe and further to play this very in-demand and extra hard game called life. Above this reality when you take off the headset, which you can only really do if your human avatar dies, I'll bet you it's teeming with life. Trillions of souls existing in the universe above this one. And jumping into this very popular simulation of the human being, role-playing, you are playing the role of a human being on the planet Earth in the year 2021. You're given a whole new identity, which is your name and genetics and environment. And you can only play as that character for that lifetime. Game. Life is a game. Even though most people will try and tell you differently. They'll tell you with furrowed brows to take it seriously. Life is serious. I'm not sure what sort of game this is, 
but at times it certainly feels like it's a pay to play. Perhaps this game was made by EA. EA Sports, it's in the game. Having an experience of a human is about the real player. The real you, who probably is living in some fantasy utopian world where everything is sorted. There is virtually no crime and nothing to do. And so, bored, they jack into the matrix and have a lifetime as you. I mean, kills a few hours, doesn't it? Perhaps the more money you have in base reality, if there is such a thing, the better the experience you can buy. It could be like going on holiday. If you're poor, you can only afford a two-star experience. If you're rich, you can afford a five-star experience. With all the trimmings, a two-star experience could be, say, a Chinese farmer girl in the year 1527 AD. But a five-star experience could be, say, an LA porn star in 1998. I was playing video games last night actually, while my friend was sitting next to me watching. He said to me, I wish real life was more like video games. So I locked him in the cupboard and told him if he wants to access the rest of my house, he's going to have to pay 25 quid for the DLC. That was the same friend who was absolutely devastated when he didn't get a PlayStation 5 for Christmas. I mean, none of us could console him. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to thank my mom, my dad, everyone who knows me. Let me ask you this question again. Why do you play video games? For fun? To kill boredom? To do things that you can't do in the real world. Like hijack cars and shoot people and compete against other players. Number one, for fun. Competing against others is fun, isn't it? In a big online multiplayer video game. And it's pretty euphoric when you win and come first out of 99 other players. Number two is to kill boredom. Because we live in quite a safe world now, don't we? even though the news tries to pretend otherwise. But us humans have a human nature that is still rooted in our evolution as animalistic beings. Sometimes we just need to satiate our need for violence. Three, to do things you couldn't ordinarily do, like shoot people. Now I would much rather you went into another simulation and shot a load of people than shot people in this simulation. Finally, challenge. To expand as beings, learning new skills, meeting new people, having adventures and experiences in a huge open world where you forget who you really are, to grow and learn and use that experience in your own life in base reality. That's why we humans play video games. But I think it's the same for the intelligence that really controls us. The whole point of this life could be to lose yourself in something else, forgetting who you are and playing the game of finding yourself. It's funny, I actually have a memory of one of my past lives. I tried to log in as a female in the China server, but it just keeps crashing on the loading screen. I think this summarises the game of life pretty well. You want to check out this new game? You try to acquire riches and battle evil forces as you advance for a strange and mysterious world. Sounds awesome, Dad! Out you go. More so, some people like to think that they're the only player in this world and everyone else is an NPC. Selfish! That's about as selfish as the beaver who said to the deer that asked him to help stop the flooding on her grazing grounds. Do you know what he said to her? Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. I've explored the idea of NPCs already and I said that it was nonsense. I think everyone is a player just like in an online multiplayer video game. There's no NPCs there. Animals might be NPCs. I've always thought it was strange that movies could literally show hundreds of humans being massacred and no one bats an eye. But you drown just one little kitten and they ask you to leave the swimming pool. The human being experience. This is the human being experience and everyone is a player. Perhaps somewhere in an arcade in deep space, there's a machine called Life the human being experience. You pop in a quid or whatever your currency is, put the headset on and wham, you're living as you. I wonder what the soundtrack to life would be. Dunno, but I bet it's written by Hans Zimmer, which reminds me, I don't know if you know this about me, but me and my friends used to be in a band called The Duvets. We were mostly just a cover band. There are no distinct objectives in the human being experience, except not dying. Perhaps the white light people see when they're apparently dying is them taking off the VR headset. And so, because you have free will, it's up to you to figure out what you want to do with your time here. This is the new patch though, because previously your ancestors likely had very little choice in what they did. Or they were severely limited to whatever sort of apprenticeships were available in the local town. 
What most players do in this human experience is trade their time for money. During this time, you could be mistaken for an NPC because you always have to run scripts like, do you want fries with that? Do you want to go large? Blah, blah, blah. But you have to say all that to get your currency. I mean, you can do this for a while, but what you need to do if you want to break free of this societal matrix is to build up a fat wad of cash and buy your way out of having to work. This is a review for the MMO RPG called Life. Let's start with the graphics. Fuck me, they're amazing. Like really crisp, you know? Except China. Character creation, in contrast to all the other MMO RPGs out there. The character creator in the game of life is not fully controlled by the player of the character. We're all born without any way to control how our initial look will be. It's like pressing the randomize button. You get what you get. You can tweak it like grow bigger muscles or just getting in shape. Oh no, I can't believe I forgot to go to the gym today. That's five years in a row now. Or if you get enough gold, go and get some plastic surgery would be my advice. But there are things you just can't change. You can't change your height, which is bloody annoying for me because I'm only five foot seven, which is shit. Mind you, the good thing about us short guys is that we're very down to earth. Difficulty setting. For instance, being born in these areas is likely to be on medium mode, and all the others is on hard mode. However, it can depend. For instance, you might be born into a very, very, very poor part of Africa, but your parents are the richest in that village. Or you might be born poor in India, but you're the right class, so you get more opportunity. So difficulty settings are about way more than about what region you spawn into. You could be born into luxury in the US, but your parents could be horrible and it fucks you up for life. However, the good thing about the game, in fact, the most fun thing about the game, is that you can move classes. If you're poor, you can become rich. This is the American dream, a large part of why the game is so bloody successful today. Mind you, as the great late George Carlin said, it's called the American dream because you have to be asleep to believe it. Factions. Just like any good MMORPG, you get to choose a faction. These range in fantasy games from wizards, orcs and healers. But in this game, you can be lawyers, doctors, teachers, or you can even choose to play with no faction and still be able to level up at the same speed as other players. And there are specific quests inside each faction. For instance, to become a police, you have to pass police college and then specify as a certain type of police, don't you? Like armed police, traffic cop, CID, whatever. Some take longer than others. To be a teacher, it's only a year to become that faction. But to become a doctor, however, it can take up to nine years. And if you're an Egyptian doctor, you're a chiropractor. There are also factions to join like sports teams, political teams, and religious groups. These are good because it gives you ready-made antagonists. And we all know without an antagonist, you won't grow and level up very much. Just like in a video game, you need the evil bad guys to fight against. Those are the boss levels. Achievements! In this game we call life, there are a myriad of achievements to attain. Some are hard to attain and some are easy. There are a few achievements that stand out since they can give you a lot of XP points if you do it right. The two hardest and thus most commonly sought out are marriage and children. It also allows you to pass on 50% of your DNA, as they call it in the game, or as I prefer, genetic code to the next generation. They did patch this a few years ago to bypass marriage before children, but some people still prefer the old way before the latest patch. But aside from them, there are numerous other achievements in this game called life. What do you get if you mix human DNA and whale DNA? Banned from SeaWorld, that's for sure. I just want to add something quickly, because I think every experience that one of you goes through is no greater or smaller than another. Every single experience is valid, even if it's shit. There is no such thing as a shit life, only how you interpret it. You need to think of it from your soul's point of view. It chose you. It wanted to live as you for a lifetime. It wanted the exact experiences that you've had and are having. And for what reason? To learn all the things that you have learned and are yet to learn. So when you feel sad, just remember that you are you for a reason. You already know this. Now all you need to do is understand why. It's not possible to go wrong or go off track. There's no such thing because it's all within the confines of life. If you feel that way, that's just the human part of you, wanting life to conform to the way that you want it to go. 
that you envisioned it would go. Winning the game of life. If life is just a game, then how do we win? Well, that's slightly open to interpretation. And this is the point of the human being experience. It's an experience, so it's not something you can necessarily win. In the same way, you can't win on a roller coaster ride. You go on it for the ride, not to win. However, I think there's one way you can win at the game called life. And it's this, doing what you like and getting paid. Now that to me is winning. One of the questions that comes up all the bloody time when talking to people about the simulation theory is Well, the simulation hypothesis is impossible because there isn't enough computing power to run a simulation. They repeat this second-hand information like it's gospel because it's famously said that in order to run a simulation of the universe, you would need a computer as big as the universe. Which would suggest that simulation theory is dead on arrival, like a mail order budgie. The question is, if this is a simulation, how on earth is it rendered? But I know a little secret. Stick with me as I explain how video games give us the answer. So the next time you tell someone about the simulation theory and they say this, to run a simulation of the universe, you'd need a computer the size of the universe. You will have the artillery to tell them that they're more wrong than James Corden dressed up as a rat dancing in the street. Let's get low. Oh wow, they're causing all that fibbing. Do you know what I mean? Someone's trying to get to hospital. The grand's dying. They're in the road. Get out the fucking road. But I don't need to diss this idea too much. It's fairly simple to debunk. And in the future, when it's known outright that this is a simulated reality, like a VR MMO RPG video game, I will be heralded as a forward thinking genius. But you already know that. I mean, you know, I already am. But unlike Copernicus, I would actually like to be around to see it. I hope they don't bring back the guillotine in the future for heretical views. Because then if they cut my head off, I really would be ahead of my time because video games may give us the answer to this question already about how to render an entire universe. The universe that you and I are currently inside. Now, let me just confuse the hell out of you by saying rather smugly, I agree with the man who said that to simulate an entire universe would require a computer the size of the universe. Like a good tree, it would. If it was rendering the entire universe, but it isn't. That is not IMO how it's rendered. This person is guessing that the universe is rendered all in one go by some big ass mother fudging computer. Nope. What a waste of energy that is, right? Nah, I reckon they're more eco-conscious in the future. Reminds me of this hippie girl I used to know. Great eco-friendly body, very little waste. It's a bit like the jokes on this channel. All the best ones are recycled. Rather than this simulation being powered all in one go by one big computer, rather, I think, just like video games, it's powered by our own individual devices in base reality. Think about it for flip flops sake. When you play an online video game, it's not one computer that simulates all of Call of Duty Warzone, is it? No, every player has their own computer rendering just their own experience. No one else's. You only look out of the eyes of the character that you are playing as via the screen. That's why I think more than this being a simulation, this is in fact a video game that we're all inside. Being rendered by our own individual computers in base reality. Let me give you an even better analogy. Think of it like your PlayStation or Xbox or PC. It sits in base reality. But then you hook up your VR headset to it and you go inside the game, but the PlayStation is still on the outside in base reality. Simulating what you're seeing on the inside. But, 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 how does a video game render the world inside the video game? Good question. When you play a video game, the computer only animates a tiny part of the world that you're actually in. It doesn't simulate the entire universe at once because there's no point in animating even what's behind your character. 
That is a waste of processing power. It only renders the part of the world that your character can see. It only renders the part where your character is, which is about 0.1% of the entire map. The rest of the world is there, but the computing power is only rendered on the tiny area that you are in and can see or observed, which is what quantum physicists would say. Easy for you to say. I quote from the Guardian newspaper. The simulation hypothesis also accounts for peculiarities in quantum mechanics, whereby things only become defined when they are observed, said Max Tegmark, a professor of physics at MIT. That's this geezer here who looks like the demon headmaster. What a great show. Quote, for decades, it's been a problem. Scientists are bent over backwards to eliminate the idea that we need a conscious observer. Maybe the real solution is you do need a conscious entity like a conscious player of a video game, he said. First, it provides a scientific basis for some kind of afterlife or larger domain of reality above our world. You don't need a miracle, faith or anything special to believe it. It comes naturally out of the laws of physics, he said. Second, it means we will soon have the same ability to create our own simulations. See, it's not just me saying this. I've got scientists coming out in their droves to agree with me. So, we can now answer the classic question. Does a tree make a noise in the forest if nobody is around to hear it? No, it doesn't. Because it wasn't rendered. It only makes a noise if it was observed by someone conscious like us. Because there's no need to waste computing power on something that isn't being observed. Remember, we are not the simulation, we are the player. We are inside the simulation, we are the player of our avatar. Your entire physical flesh, body, organs and brain are part of the simulation. But your mind, your consciousness, that bit that you think with, is not part of the simulation. That bit will carry on and go back to base reality when your avatar dies. We, you and I, are the universe experiencing itself. Life is basically a game for some immortal beings. Think of it as a mandatory or fun activity that we have chosen as immortal beings. Life is a video game and that was how it's rendered. Yo, what's up, it's Jack. Rumours about the Matrix 4 film are hotting up faster than Uncle Roger's walk, with a reported plot leak which is more interesting than wondering what the Queen of England has in her handbag. My guess is there's a cherry flavoured lip balm, a taser, a family picture with Meghan's face cut out, a thousand pounds in fifty pound notes, the TV remote and one of those little miniature pots of tip tree strawberry jam. Anyway, now the YouTuber that allegedly got on his hands on the entire plot of The Matrix 4 claiming that he's a source and he's seen the entire movie, unless he's just like this guy. On holiday in Spain one year, me and my mate took a pedlo out and we went to Africa. Do you think you could spare us the bullshit for one minute? Seems to be legitimate though, as YouTube deleted the video after copyright claim from Warner Brothers. However, in this video, we're going to explore what clues The Matrix 4 will be dropping into the idea of the simulation theory. Just to preface this, if you have no idea what the simulation theory is, where the bloody hell have you been all your life? No. But if you want a full breakdown of the simulation theory, go to this video where I go into depth on it, then come back to this video or just watch this video all the way through and then go to the other, forget it, whatever. Many people were surprised when the Wachowski siblings announced that they were working on a fourth instalment of the Matrix franchise, especially because the Matrix 3 was shit. Nah, that was alright. The original film trilogy kind of wrapped things up. Spoiler alert! This video contains the plot, only a little bit of it. So, you know, if you don't want to know, you can just F off. I used to love the Matrix films, and I've seen them so many times, I'm surprised I don't have an American accent, and no Kung Fu. I'm also surprised I didn't buy myself a long leather jacket down to my ankles in a pathetic attempt to look trendy and shortcut respect because we all know it just has the opposite effect. 
In this video, we're exploring the leaked plot for the film and what clues this gives us towards the philosophy of the simulation theory. In short, the simulation theory seeks to prove what we call life is actually a simulated reality run, most likely, by a super intelligent race, likely being ourselves in the future. And this world could be an ancestor simulation, which means that we are living the lives of our ancestors in their journey through the growth of humanity, from when we were first seeded on this planet to when we first crawled on land to the invention of the internet. You are all of those people at once because you and I are the same. We are one. We are God experiencing itself subjectively as individuals as we race towards the future and towards the moment that we invent the technology to enter said simulation. Now, there could be multiple versions of simulations we invent before we get to the one that we invent that puts us into this world. I know my mind is struggling to comprehend what I'm saying too, but it's like the Oculus VR machine. There are multiple versions of it and they keep bringing out new ones. Well, the simulation we're in could be the Simulation 50. Now you could argue that the Matrix movie single-handedly brought the simulation theory into popular mainstream discourse. Knock it off with the fancy words, mate! Alright, I mean, they made people talk about it because now we have a reference point. So what does the new plot for The Matrix 4 tell us about the continuation of the simulation theory? Here's the plot. Allegedly, The Matrix has been updated since the last film and takes place 60 years after revolutions. There are loads of self-referential jokes about the movie reboots, and this in itself is a bit of a soft reboot to the series. The film begins very similarly to the first movie with agents chasing down a character called Bugs, played by Jessica Hendrick. I'll just have to Google her, as I don't know who you are, Jessica. Henrik, no, absolutely no idea, no idea. Apparently, Morpheus is now an agent played by Yahya Abdul-Mateen. Don't know who he is, but is a bootleg copy of the original Morpheus, who is now dead. When Neo updated the Matrix, he created his copy of Morpheus. Okay, now it's getting complicated, isn't it? Neil Patrick Harris, that's this guy who seems to have lost most of his neck, plays a villain called The Analyst, and is also Neo's therapist. Basically, Neo is alive and has flashback to the events of the other films while forgetting who he actually is. The plot essentially is about Neo trying to reconnect with Trinity, who is still alive, and become the One once more. In a twist at the very end, it's revealed that Trinity has powers of the One, and the two work together in a visually amazing fight. Good to know that there's gonna be some fighting. What does this tell us about whether the film will continue to explore the idea of the simulation? Well, from that initial synopsis, what it's hinting at is the Matrix, or reality, has been rebooted. Now, if this world is indeed a simulation, it could be, theoretically, rebooted at any time. Have you tried turning it off and on again? And how would we know? We're not trained to know. It's not really in the interest of the people who run the simulation for us to know that it is a simulation. Kind of defeats the whole point of it, doesn't it? It's like playing as a character on Grand Theft Auto, who just wakes up and stops being controlled by the controller and just sods off to the bar. Obviously, we have to be careful with paradelia and apathenia, which is where our brains can see patterns in things which do not exist. It's like when you can see a face in the curtains. Not really a face there, it's just your brain playing tricks on you. But there are a number of unexplained phenomena called the Mandela Effect, which could feed into the narrative of this being a simulation. Now, on one hand, this could prove that this is a simulation, and on the other hand, could prove the fallibility of a human being's memory. Or it could point to something much more scary. Glitches in the Matrix! Here are some of my favorite glitches in the Matrix. Now, the first one is one I remember, which is the Looney Tunes. I thought I was having an attack of my senses, as I always remember Looney Tunes Looney Tunes as the Looney Tunes, as in cartoons. I was genuinely surprised to hear that it never was tunes, but it was always tunes. Now, again, this could be the infallibility of one's memory, and my memory, and my memory in particular, is rubbish. A genie actually gave me a choice once. He said, do you want a longer memory or a longer penis? And I forget which one I chose. Or the Looney Tunes could be a glitch. I remember a different part of history in another simulation where things didn't get changed correctly. Or that could just be bollocks. Other glitches include, obviously, the thing that it's named after, Nelson Mandela's death, which says, Nelson Mandela, who this theory is named after, died in 2013. However, countless people distinctly remember him dying in prison in the 1980s. The Bernstein Bears, 
The next one is the Bernstein Bears. The lovable cartoon bear family actually spelt their name, their last name with an A, as in the Bernstein Bears. Now, this is according to Google. The Mandela Effect is an unusual phenomena where a large group of people remember something differently than how it occurred. Conspiracy theorists believe this is proof of an alternate universe, while many doctors use it as an illustration of how imperfect memory can be sometimes. Or is it a glitch in the Matrix? Some of the main characters in the Matrix films are the agents, like Agent Smith, who is a big, bad, evil, nasty, wise guy. Now the agents are working beha on behalf of the machines against humanity. The idea of the grey suits and sunglasses of Agent Smiths come from the famed FBI and in particular the apparent men in black who would deal with off-world matters. You know, aliens and shit. Now it's entirely possible that these agents could be working on behalf of the simulation who know it's a simulation and are here to keep it running, preserving it and prevent the people inside the simulation from waking up. Because if the people wake up and realise it's all a game, then the whole game is up. Probably. Now I think that knowing that life is a simulation is liberating because it just means that nothing really matters, not like we think it does. Remember Neo in the first film, he was depressed because he was searching for the answers, that life is a simulation. He knew it, but he just couldn't prove it until someone showed him. Morpheus! When I say nothing really matters, what I mean is that people worry too much about the wrong things. Of course, things matter, but only because we let them matter. Knowing that life is just a simulation is a chance to calm the fuck down and realise that life is a dream anyway. So you might as well enjoy it, rather than go on doing things that you don't want to do, just so you can keep on going, doing things that you don't want to do, keeping on going, doing things you don't want to do. And in for bloody Nartum. Now my theory is slightly different from the Matrix, who propose that we're all batteries. I don't think we're all batteries. Or we'd have little plus and minus signs on us, wouldn't we? Mind you, people are either positive or negative. I wonder, if you throw one at someone, will you get charged with battery? But because it's a film, it needs to spice the whole thing up, doesn't it? and uh, give the humans something to fight against, i.e. the machines. That's the importance of an antagonist like Agent Smith. If you have nothing to fight against, you stop growing because you don't need to. This film is a reboot, so it will probably stick with the idea that reality is simulated by the machines to keep humans in servitude. Now, this idea is not unviable. If AI grows and learns exponentially quick, it could theoretically turn on us and decide that keeping us still and simulating our existence could prove far more beneficial for it, us and the planet, which is grim and more depressing than a James Corden comedy. My own thoughts are that to continue the franchise they might explore a little deeper into the simulation theory with the apparent reboot of the Matrix simulation and with the knowledge that we've collected over the last 20 years since the first film came out. There could be nods towards Elon Musk and his neural net, or the singularity towards AI, which run the machines and keep them in servitude, and multiple other signs that we are in fact in a simulation. But more importantly, what do you think? Let me know in the comments below. Is the entire world a simulation? Is everything just computer code interpreted by your brain to look real? Are we actually living inside a video game? The simulation theory is, I've been told, a bit complicated. So, I thought I'd make a video for noobs! Think of it as a gateway video into the deep, dark rabbit hole that is Simulation Hypothesis. But don't let that big word put you off. I won't done none more big words than that. I promise you won't see the world in the same way by the end of this video. As I explain how this big bloody world will live inside this matrix. The thing you see smell, hear, taste, and experience on a daily basis 24 bloody 7 until you die is probably a simulated video game. Life is a simulation for noobs. With the rise of technologically thingy my bobbies, e speciali, virtual reality, artificial intelligence, and video gamies. Now we have the language to explain it to noobs like you because the simulation hypo has come to be one of the most exciting and respected new ideas around. Not just by plebs like you, but also by renowned scientists, thought leaders, whatever that means, and people at the forefront of technology. Because they've all said it's not just a probability, it's a likelihood. But where did the simulation theory come from? I don't know where it all started. 
to be honest, probably in a cave around a fire, where one caveman said to another, ooh, 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 and the other one went, yeah, I reckon it is as well. With our current technology, it gave us a new vocab, didn't it? That means vocabulary, like words and that, didn't it? With which to explore this theory. It brought the theory into realms we can all understand because we're just chimps really, aren't we? With little metal devices telling us how important we all are. But you're not important, so you know, shut up. For instance, we now have fully immersive VR systems capable of producing a simulated world for you to step into and to participate in. Doesn't take much of a leap of faith to imagine what this VR world will look like in just 10 years. Tell ya, my guess is it will be almost as sexy as me. And will almost look basically indistinguishable from reality. Like me. That's just 10 years away, probably. So if you can accept that, now imagine 100 years into the future. The year is 2121. It isn't hard to imagine that you could slip on a headset, a haptic feedback suit, take an amnesia pill, and wake up as a baby, being born into a strange new world like this. Oh, this place is the best. It's got beer, games, prizes, and you can never tell what time it is. You sold a gun to a murderer so you could play video games? Yeah, sure. I mean, if you spend all day shuffling words around, you can make anything sound bad, Morty. Here, check this out. Ah! <gasps> Whoa. Shit! Shit! Oh! Oh, what the hell? Whoa, whoa, where am I? 55 what the years, hell? not bad. Waking up as a baby in a strange new world, eh? Oh, nice little Aldous Huxley reference there. If strange meant brave. That's for all the people that can read books, which I admit is a minority. To be fair, I read on the news that drinking is quite bad for you. So I quit reading. The Matrix movies really kicked the Sim theory into the limelight, which is incidentally what they use as lights during filming. That's why it looks green. Limelight. Oh, I shouldn't have to explain every bloody joke for f The first film was made in 1999, way ahead of its time, before we even had proper mobile phones. And so, with the rise of technology over the last 20 years, like mobile phones, wearables, VR, PlayStation, video games, internet, and all of that, it's become easier to imagine the Matrix actually becoming a reality, like in real life. However, rather than the bleak backstory that the Matrix proposes, I rather think my version is much better, like Husky Musky says. You wanna be, I mean, my theory is like, you'd rather be optimistic I think I'd rather, I'd rather be optimistic and wrong than pessimistic and right. Rather than this being a simulation created by an evil AI that looks like a metallic squid looking thing from the future to keep us all asleep, I think we all willingly choose to come here to participate in a video game called Life. The Human Being Experience, a VR, MMO, RPG, amnesia vacation for the soul. In 2003, Nick Bostrom, Oxford philosopher and a bloke brighter than a limelight pie. That's a good joke because it works on two levels, doesn't it? Bit like my A-level results. I got A, B, B, A. And still, no employer wants to take a chance on me. Don't look at me like that. I know they're not very funny. I have to keep putting jokes in there to keep you interested, don't I? What do you mean, why? Because you've got the attention of a bloody five-year-old. That's why. If you're just going to keep arguing back with me, you could just, you know, f*** off. I accept your apology. Let's continue. Cut to Jack in the drawing room. Oh, hello. Welcome back. Anyway, Brain Box Bostrom wrote a paper called The Simulation Argument. And no, it's not just about how to argue. Grow up. Oh, yeah, if you come over and say that. He says the history of humanity could be an ancestor simulation run by humans from the future. Ooh, time travelly. In his paper, Nicky B laid out three potential conclusions. First, humanity will go extinct before entering the post-human state. Can't make The Sims 50 if we're dead, can we? Let's assume then that humans do evolve to the post-human state. Mother Every time I say post-human, just conjures up this image of a little man with a load of stamps all over him. These future humans might not be interested in running simulations. The snobby mother fudgers. But what if humans do progress into a post-human state and we're interested in running ancestor simulations? Because let's face it, we would, wouldn't we? In that case, it's very likely that our current universe is a simulated reality. 
Ooh, bet you got your brain in a bigger tangle now than Rapunzel when Amazon forgot her order of head and shoulders. That's a shampoo. Because, you know, she got long hair and that. Hmm. Never mind that. The fact is, scientists in the field of quantum physics are finding new evidence every day to support this seemingly outlandish theory. I left the scientific papers to the Simi theory below in the description so you can read them. I bet you won't though, will you? You'll just take what I said as read, won't you? Similar questions have plagued humanity for thousands of years. The concept of this simulation is very similar to creationism. Many religions all claim the same thing, that this world was sculpted by a supreme being out of nothing, which is a bit like a video game in it, because that is something, but it's also nothing. It's not physical. You can't touch it or anything, is what I mean. But you won't find the word simulation in any religious texts. That's because they didn't have mobile phones. They didn't have the language to explain the simulation. They didn't have words like computer, AI, or simulation. All they had was God, demon, angels, illusions, and reflections. From the perspective of your brain, how would you know if your reality is real or simulated? Imagine, you go into a VR game. If a video game looks identical to this world, and through a combination of noises and atmosphere, it can make you feel as scared as you would be in this world, does that make the unreal real? if it has the same effect on you as the real. You are suspending your disbelief temporarily. You know it's not real. If you know you can escape from the video game by lifting off the VR headset, it influences your behavior. The stakes going into the game are low because you know it doesn't matter. Even if your emotions are genuine, you know it's going to end anytime you like because you know that you are you, not the character that you are temporarily playing as inside the game. Now imagine that the next VR headset comes out and it says that by tapping into your brainwaves, they can make you forget that you are you. That you can go into the game not knowing it's a game. Not knowing that you could just take off the headset and leave at any moment. Would you enter it? Or was this a decision you've already made? Now that you believe that, let's zap 100 years into the hypothetical future. There's no need to work. It's likely very boring. And just like that, we distill the best bits of life into a film or video game. They distill the best bits of life into what we call a lifetime. VR has come on leaps and bounds. There's no clunky headset, just a little button you attach to your temple. The graphics look exact. You literally cannot tell your two worlds apart. You get to choose the exact experience you want before you go in. And completely immerse yourself in it by forgetting who you are. People may forego their real lives in favor of virtual ones. And in a utopian world, there's not much else to do, except as Nick Bostrom purports, play through the lives of our ancestors. It does sound a lot like science fiction. I'll give you that. Whether this is a simulation or not, it's likely that this is the only reality you will ever know. The new Ryan Reynolds film sensation, Free Guy, about an NPC living inside a video game, is a streaming and cinema smash. NPCs living inside a video game. Now where the flip have I heard that before? There is no easy way to say this. This world, it's a video game. As I explain why you are actually living in a video game. Play a video game. What we call life is a big, complex, simulated, game. I watched Free Guy. So here it is, the ultimate 100% NPC, life is a video game, VR, sandbox, MMO, RPG, nuts and guts, helter skelter, slip sliding, hip gliding, mother fudging take on Free Guy, life in a video game. Ryan Reynolds plays Guy, an NPC or non-player character. Who, if you don't know, are the characters in the video game who are not playable. They're just there to add life and texture to the game, while you and or your character murks them. You're a non-player character. A background person. Someone designed to make the game more fun for real people. Guy works as a bank teller. and spends his time with his best friend Buddy, unaware his world is a video game. Here, we get a big slice of Groundhog Day, where the NPCs repeat the same actions every day. Bit like this world, really. The storyline kicks off when NPC Guy starts to think independently from his script, which upsets the other NPCs. 
medium coffee, cream two sugars. Actually, I think I'd like to try a cappuccino today. Ooh, cappuccino. I enjoy saying that. It's like a waterfall made of letters. Excuse me? I'd like to try a cappuccino. The video game world called Free City is filled with these NPCs who play host to the real players. If you wear sunglasses, you're a player. You're jacking in and playing inside the game knowing that you're inside a video game. Whereas the NPCs don't wear sunglasses. She's wearing sunglasses. We don't mess with the sunglasses people. And when he does put the sunglasses on, he sees the game. This is an interesting concept given that Facebook wants to start the next metaverse, which could be incredibly similar to Free City. For one, they own Oculus, and they also just released these. There's also more Easter eggs in this film than at a Cadbury's chocolate factory. Like. Captain America and the Hulk, also owned by Disney. Star Wars, lightsabers, also owned by Disney. Mind you, what isn't? The Shining, Grand Theft Auto Online, Groundhog Day, The Matrix, The Truman Show, Ready Player One, as well as a reference to Fortnite. I think, as well as numerous others. This film also becomes like Spot the Reference or Easter Egg. In fact, you could even go so far as to describe the film as a mashup between The Truman Show meets The Matrix meets Ready Player One with a dash of They Live and a massive chunk of Grand Theft Auto online thrown in for good measure. I quite like the running commentary from Twitchers and Twatters and YouTubers who are watching Guy's progress as he leveled up inside the game. It raises an interesting question, doesn't it? If this is a giant video game, what if we're being watched and judged in base reality? What if there are streamers and YouTubers or the equivalent who are commenting on everything we do throughout our lives, judging every action we take and commenting on it? Perhaps that's why sometimes we have the feeling of being watched. Ooh, creepy. Coming soon, Free City 2. Bigger, better, rider. I thought they missed a trick with this film because they don't enter the game. They use a screen to play the game. I think they should have jacked into this game via a VR headset like they do in Ready Player One. That would have made these bits where they're in the game more understandable. But hey, I ain't no movie critic. I don't think it'll be long before Free City in VR is a reality, with VR technology progressing at its current rate. In the film, the code for the game was stolen by Tiger Waititi's character who renamed the game Free City. Originally, it was titled Life Itself by the two indie developers. If I was going to design an immersive VR holiday type experience for your bored out of its mind, utopian post-human being, I'd call it better than life. In Free Guy, they allude to base reality being quite boring. How many times a day are the banks robbed in your world? Hardly ever, Guy. What about corpses, Millie? You see what? a lot of those? How many an hour? None per hour, Guy. I've said this before, the base reality is likely to be incredibly boring. And so has Elon Musk. Roll the clip. I think most likely, this is just about probability, there are many, many simulations. These simulations are, we might as well call them reality, or you could call them multiverse. These simulations you believe are created? Like someone has manufactured? They're running on the substrate. So... That substrate is probably boring. Boring? Mm -hmm. How so? Well, when we create a simulation, like a game or a movie, it's the distillation of what's interesting about life. You know, like it, it takes it take a year to shoot an action movie, and then that's all distilled down into two or three hours. 
So I think most likely, if we're a simulation, it's really boring outside the simulation. Because why would you make a simulation that's boring? It makes simulation way more interesting than base reality. The point is that if your world is boring and safe, you will seek out experiences that you can't get in your normal world. A video game is a distillation of reality. A video game about life would be a short distillation of our real life up there in base reality. That's why I would call it better than life because it's a distillation of all the things that make life, life. When Guy realizes that he doesn't exist, he has, like many of you have probably had already, an existential crisis. His best friend Buddy gives this answer. What would you do if you found out that you weren't real? I say, okay, so what if I'm not real? I'm sorry, so what? Yeah, so what? But if you're not real, doesn't that mean that nothing you do matters? What does that mean? Look, brother, I am sitting here with my best friend trying to help him get through a tough time, right? And even if I'm not real, this moment is right here, right now. This moment is real. I mean, what's more real than a person trying to help someone they love? Now, if that's not real, I don't know what is. I couldn't have said it better myself. Even if we're not real and we are inside a video game, we're here now, aren't we? So it must be for something. Sophie's character tells Guy that he needs to level up before they can talk. Wait, how will I know that I've leveled up enough? Uh, get over 100 and we'll talk. Whoa. So he goes off into the world and levels up by becoming the good guy, rather than go about trashing the place like all the other real players. Leveling up is a part of all games. It's how you measure improvement. But what's the equivalent in our life? In the game, the only way Guy knew he had a level was when he put the sunglasses on to see his heads up display. But what is the heads up display in our life? It would be really brilliant if we could just know our level and know what to do to progress to the next one. I don't think it's as easy as be the good guy or be the bad guy. And sometimes it certainly feels like I'm stuck on a level. Perhaps we're just not meant to know what level we're on. And perhaps this isn't a video game that you can win. Perhaps it's only the soul or the player of each of us that really knows. Perhaps it's your soul that decided the type of experience it wanted you to have so that it could gain the relevant XP points it needed to level up an aspect of itself which is going to upset you because it's not about you, the human being you. And your ego is now triggered because the ego is part of the human you, see? The soul is the you behind the sunglasses. In the game, they know it's a game. But in this game called life, only some of us know it's a game. And the rest are best left plugged in. Buddhism and the simulation theory has Jack lost his feckin' mind? What's he talking about? He's gone full on wacko. Wacko, wacko, wacko. Bear with me, because I'm about to tell you why the Buddha, that big fat happy motherfucker, reckons that there is a way out of the matrix. I'm about to tell you, lucky people, what the Buddhists knew about the simulation theory. Buddhism has some funny little clues in it that point to this, the world, I mean being a simulation. As I talk about on my channel, ad in for bloody Nartum. Because there's still people out there that need waking up. Oh, you thought I should look like Morpheus. No way, I'm walking around in a long black leather coat. I'll get beaten up. To quote Buddhism, they said this. Cue the voiceover. All phenomena are like reflections appearing in a very clear mirror, devoid of inherent existence. Which sounds to me like they just described a video game don't it? Like a video game, because that is merely 2D images made to look 3D and moving. Mirroring our reality, but devoid of inherent existence. They don't really exist. See? Buddhists call the world Maya, which translated means illusion. I got caught masturbating to an optical illusion. I said it's not what it looks like. Buddha, literally translated, means awake. So Buddhism is really Awakeism, which is surprising because monks always seem to have their eyes closed. According to Buddhism, we are actually playing through multiple lives. Just like a video game like Mario, where you get to live multiple lives. 
and reincarnation is literally you respawning back into this world. It's like when the Buddha walked up to a hot dog stand and said, make me one with everything, greedy fat fucker. You gain experiences or XP points from each lifetime that you play as. So when I say you, I mean the real you. The soul or the spirit of the player. Not the human you. When we enter or spawn into this world, we cross a river of forgetfulness, as they call it in Buddhism. Someone said how forgetful I was the other day. Can't remember who. Perhaps that's why we can't explain our tendency to like certain things, or have a natural ability to do certain things. They could come from our previous lives. So if human beings go through reincarnation, does that mean shoes go for a reboot? I mean, I could be talking out my absolute arse on this one, because I'm about as educated on Buddhism as the Buddha himself is on how to rent a property. As you all know, when the landlord tried to evict him, the Buddha sat there and went, nah, must stay. Even more disturbing is the ultimate goal of Buddhism, Nirvana. Yeah, they pinched the name from that 90s grunge band. Nirvana is like the holy fucking grail to anyone that wears an orange robe. I'm pretty sure you don't achieve Nirvana by blowing your brains out though, that's for sure. I do know that. According to Google, for Buddhists, since the first precept is to refrain from the destruction of all life, including oneself, suicide then is seen as a negative act. If someone commits suicide in anger, he may be reborn in a sorrowful realm due to negative final thoughts. I like to think of Kurt Cobain as the Michelangelo of rock, although both of them had very different approaches to painting ceilings. Oh, shut up. He doesn't care, does he? He's dead. Can't be offended if you're dead, unless he's a ghost. You might haunt me. Mind you, I'm not worried, because he'd be a blind, deaf and mute ghost, wouldn't he? Apparently, you achieve Nirvana by avoiding the three poisons. Greed, aversion and ignorance. Well, that's me fucked then. Once you accomplish that, you are rewarded by being free of constant cycle and rebirth, where you live and die in a series of lives that act as a teaching experience. Achieving Nirvana leads to Parinirvana, or the final Nirvana, which is an afterlife for souls that have been freed from the constant cycle of rebirth into this world. Basically, what goes on here is just like a heaven type place, where you're basically just like a god type being and can have whatever you want. Oh yeah! Before you get excited, this is the same as most religions. Sorry using the old carrot and stick method of do good, be rewarded, do bad, get whacked with a stick and get forced to live another life in this imperfect world. Probably as something awful like James Corden's wife. Worryingly, the entire concept of trying to attain Nirvana is very quest-like, a feature reminiscent of any computer game you've played. Even comes with the aforementioned respawn feature that you can play over and over again until you succeed at some quest that you're not told anything bloody about. That's why I think it's bollocks. How can you play a video game when you have no idea what the rules are? How unfair is that? You can't go, right, off you go into the game, go on! You play it, bewildered, trying to figure out what the bloody hell you're supposed to be doing. Then afterwards you come out and they go, Oh, you didn't play it right. Off you go again. Have another go. Makes no sense. Nirvana is what they term as an end to reincarnating on Earth, which I admit is an alluring prospect. That just comes from the human part of me, isn't it? Then bloody knackered, shagged out, curious, endlessly surprised and approaching middle-aged human me. Perhaps the soul that inhabits this meat body in all its sexiness does want to keep coming back because it gets to live in an exciting part of human history. That's where the problem arises, where religion meets reality. Because throughout the majority of the time humans have believed in a god or religion, we've managed to kill, slain, rape, pillage, murder and enslave more people in the name of God than anything else. For Christ's sake. It's not just religion, it's also what I call the New Age religion. I used to be into all that hippie, woo-woo, positive thinking, law of attraction, think yourself rich, the secret, reiki, hot stone, flip-flops and hairy legs, hemp clothes and hippie motherfucking shite. When I was young, dumb and more naive than trusting a bear to look after my beehives. You see, 
This new age shit says basically the same things, just in a different way, and sat around a bunch of inanimate fucking coloured rocks. I think it's more than just giving people the truth and knowledge about how and why we're here in the world. It's about control. Keeping you in control so you don't do anything bad. Because you can't be trusted, can ya? You? You're only a thick little human pleb, aren't you? So if you're bad, you go to hell. Or you get bad karma. Or whatever version you believe in. And it works, even today. Because fear bypasses the logical side of your brain. Can't remember what side. And goes straight into the bit responsible for self-preservation. That's why it works. It trips the fear part of your brain. It's like a cheat code to socially engineering the human being to be good and do what you're told. I mean, come on. If priests really believed in hell, they wouldn't go around touching kiddies, would they? Whereas, I think this is simply a way, before law and order and police, to get people to police themselves. You see, good and bad are human choices, and this is a human game. When you're playing GTA, you can run someone over, but you don't feel bad, do you? Not an ounce, because you know that it's just a game. But, big but. Oh. Couldn't do that in Buddhism, because they don't have sex or anything like that. They've given it all up. Until you see a big pair of lovely boobies, and suddenly you start questioning everything you believe in. Enlightenment ain't got nothing on a lovely pair of breasticles. These monks are funny, though. Seems a little odd to me that you would just, I don't know, check out of this life and just basically go to sleep. Well, nothing can hurt me if I just sit and meditate for a hundred years. Buddhism is about avoiding suffering, which is great. I like that. But the problem is, they don't do anything. Their method of dealing with suffering is just to do nothing. If I don't go anywhere, I can't possibly suffer. Also, if one of the core principles of achieving Nirvana is avoiding greed, then please explain to me why the Buddha is a big fat motherfucker. And you know the daft thing is, we hold them in a kind of reverence, don't we? Buddhists are held up with this mystical allure of magical wizardry in the West. And yet, you know, they're still like us. They have three good meals and one good shit a day. And they like boobies. Anyway, Buddhists aren't that enlightened. Look at this. Wacky! Go on, punch his face in! Use your Jedi mind powers on him. Listen, I don't want you lot all going off joining some Buddhist convent. Firstly, because that means you won't be able to watch my videos. And secondly, because I think they're wrong. Who the hell do you think you are saying the Buddha's wrong? That's the thing, you can insult Buddhists all you like. They ain't gonna do anything. The overarching answer is this. The simulation hypothesis states that reality is an illusion, and so does Buddhism. But is Buddhism the answer? Does it give us a way out of the matrix? What do you think? Tell me by text in the comments, and watch this video next that'll tell you why life is an MMORPG. I get asked in a lot of comments what I think about the idea of NPCs. What the flip does NPC mean? NPC is short for non-playable character. Here's the question, do they really exist? How do you know if someone is an NPC? Am I an NPC? Or am I the only one exists and everyone else is an NPC? It would certainly explain the success of James Corden. Tell you what, let's start with what an NPC is. Then I'll tell you exactly what I think and know about the idea of non-playable characters. What are NPCs? They are the non-playable characters in video games. They're basically any character that is not controlled by you. Maybe they're the shopkeeper or the character in the cutscenes. They look and sound like a real character, but they have set responses, or a script if you will, that drive the main character's plot forward. Could it be that these non-player characters exist in our real world? Walking among us, going out and about without a thought in their head, merely artificially intelligent flesh robots. Be prepared to be more disturbed than when you first found out where babies come from. NPCs started as a meme to categorise a certain group of people as unthinking non-players, using this image of a robotic looking person. And Twitter actually banned anyone using this meme in the most NPC move possible. I actually got banned from Twitter, yeah, for saying that the past tense of a tweet 
is a twat. Mind you, it's more lenient than Facebook jail because Twitter gives out shorter sentences. One day, YouTube, Twitter and Facebook will probably merge and it'll be called You Twat Face. In The Matrix, Agent Smith's job was to round up any rogue programs, i.e. people that woke up out of the program realising that it was a simulation. As Morpheus says, the other players inside The Matrix are real, they just haven't woken up yet. Another movie that isn't out yet, called Free Guy, follows a similar but updated concept. This world, it's a video game. The main guy, played by Ryan Reynolds, is literally an NPC. Listen to me, you're not real. And he realises this. He's shown that life, or his world, is actually a giant video game. Millie, I know this world is just a game. Where have I heard that before? But what are the characteristics of an NPC? Can we tell them apart from normal players? How do you know that you're not one? What about Westworld, a HBO slash Sky TV series? Westworld is a giant open world Western game, a bit like Red Dead Redemption, populated by robots that think they're living out their real life. Their lines are scripted. One of the main reasons people think NPCs could live among us is their discovery that some people have no inner monologue. You know, that voice that talks to you during the day. That chatter in the skull that starts the moment you wake up. Researchers found out that actually five out of the 30 test subjects had no inner monologue. Which, if you extrapolate that out to the entire population, then works out to be about 17%. Which we shouldn't, because 30 scientific subjects is nothing. Could just have so happened to pull in five psychopaths. But this is the question it raises. If they have no inner monologue, do they have a mind? What the hell goes on in there? So you mean to say that they don't have that chattering in the skull that keeps you up at night? Are they simply robots living among us? If so, why and where did they come from? And why are they here? NPCs may appear real, but they could simply be a machine. Artificial intelligence. With set responses that mimics a real human being. This is the part where I tell you that the idea of NPCs is bullshit. Sorry. Now I've got you thinking about it all overnight and got you all excited, I'm going to burst your bubble harder than a Nazi Zeppelin. Unfortunately, I've not seen, heard or found any compelling evidence whatsoever to point to NPCs being real. This is the problem. There is no evidence for people being NPCs. Not one shred of scientific evidence. It's a nice idea, but that's all it really is. The fact that some people don't have an inner monologue is just a quirk of the human mind. But to say that they aren't human is just plain inaccurate. Just because you want something to be real doesn't make it so. Just because you like the idea doesn't make it true. Technically, everyone is an NPC to you because they're not playable by you. You are the only one who is playable by you. But that doesn't mean they're NPCs in the way that they're robotic, non-thinking entities. That they are expendable in some way. And how does this relate to the simulation theory? If you think about single player games like Red Dead Redemption, you control the main character. All the other characters in the story are NPCs. What's more popular today? Single player games or multiplayer games? Multiplayer games. Why? Because they're more fun when you know you're going up against other real people. It's more challenging and more rewarding. Each person exists in the game, fighting alongside or against each other in massive maps. I think we're all main characters in this game. Occasionally, we'll play a role in someone else's game giving them a bit of script that inspires them to go on to do something. But that doesn't mean that we're not real. It's more complicated than that. And it's hard for you to wrap your head around the complexity of this giant computer game. That's why the NPC meme caught on. Again, it's an easy answer to a complex problem. But people today are lazy. I mean, if you've got any evidence that isn't anecdotal, then I'd love to hear it. Our world could be a simulated reality kind of like The Matrix, but more, in my opinion, akin to a giant multiplayer video game. Do NPCs exist in multiplayer games? No, because they don't need to. I know a lot of you would like to think it's true, but that's just a question of laziness on your part. LAZY! This simulation could have been specifically set up for billions of individual parts of one consciousness that we call God to experience itself subjectively in this virtual, holographic simulation multiplayer video game to log into an avatar and play the game aka a lifetime interacting with each other increases the quality of the game just like a multiplayer game the npc idea could be dangerous for it could be an excuse to neglect empathy but there are no npcs just people people on a different path to you treat them with kindness and sympathy wherever you can 
and treat them as you would like to be treated. This will give you more points when you finish the game and you won't need to keep coming back in multiple incarnations because you need more points if the simulation theory is true, which it is. There are no NPCs in the way that you think there are. It's lazy thinking. Just people that either think differently from you or are very normal, thus giving the impression that they are not actively participating or they're young and or impressionable and make it seem like they don't have a mind of their own but they do it doesn't mean that they're not an active participant in this game that we call life life is a multiplayer video game. we are each players in each other's game like actors in each other's plays no one takes precedent or is more important than someone else we could do i think with learning to care a bit more for our fellow humans whatever they choose to think at this moment know that a little bit more care and love in the world is no bad thing. What if you do not actually exist? Can't get your head around that one, can you? Well, don't worry, you're not stupid, probably. You're certainly not as stupid as a dumb gymnast, because they're all flipping idiots. In this video, I want to tell you about the possibility that you might not exist. At least not in the way that you think you do. And near the end, give you a cheat code to win at this video game called Life. I'm going to bait your noodles so hard that by the end of this video, I could open your skull and use your brain as a foot and give you an existential crisis so large you're going to need to change your knickers. There was a study that measured people's brain activity as to when they made a decision to press the button in front of them. That's shocking. What they found out was more shocking than death row. The brain decided to press the button a substantial amount of time before the human registered the decision to consciously press the button. So maybe the act of choosing something is itself just a game that the brain plays on itself to justify what it was already going to do or what it was scripted to do. Just like I script these YouTube videos for you. Perhaps we're all following a script with our lie. It's funny, I actually scripted a comedy play about the birth of the dictionary. Yeah, it was a play on words. Which raises the question, is life scripted? Do we have free will? Or is life already mapped out for us? Do you ever get the feeling that you're being guided down a certain path in life? Like the Truman Show. Like you suddenly find yourself at a crossroads and you have two decisions. What does that remind you of? A computer game, right? Let me explain. A computer game is kind of mapped out cleverly to follow a narrative. However, when you're playing, it fluidly guides you through the storyline whilst making you feel like you're the one making all the decisions. Now I hear you saying, yeah, but Jack, there's loads of things I do. I'm making decisions all the time. Oh yeah? Well, let me just break it down for you. You don't control your breathing, do you? Bet you are, now I've mentioned it. Breathe! Trying to manually control your breath is annoying. We're not very good at it. And so we let the subconscious take over. You are now breathing manually. Please don't stop. So you don't control your breathing or the function of your organs. You don't control the things you like or dislike. We judge those based on our feelings. We don't really control a lot of our feelings. You don't control your likes or dislikes to a certain degree. You don't control going to sleep or waking up. You don't control when you need a crap or a wee. And you don't control when you need water or food. Ad infa bloody nata. So if you're not all of those things, what even are you? Most of those things are automatic and not at least mediated by you consciously. Is there anything you do control? Not really, no. You don't control you, most of your bodily functions or the external world. Animals are not able to be self-aware, we don't think. I mean, we're not able to know really, are we? However, octopuses, octopus, octopi, octopuses, octopi, octopus pie, what the hell are you talking about, man? Sounds like some sort of insidious Japanese game show, whatever. Octopuses have been classed as sentient in the UK, which means that they are aware of themselves as a thing, experiencing the world as a thing. I mean, of course they are. They're unlike anything else on this flipping planet. They're clearly some sort of alien creature that's come sliding out the inside of a crashed meteor from an alien planet. Because what the flip has that evolved from? There's nothing else like that that's got eight legs. Not in the water anyway. And it's nothing like a spider. It's just a mental looking thing. I actually went to this seafood restaurant once and this waiter came up to me and said, the special today is octopus, but it takes four hours to prepare. I said, why is that? He said, well, we cook it alive, but it keeps turning the gas off. There's something inside us that knows it's a thing. Or perhaps we only know we're a thing because people have told us we are and people told them that they're a thing. However, what it all boils down to is that even if you don't exist, you are here now experiencing this brilliant video, aren't you? Or as Descartes said, I think therefore I am, which doesn't apply to everyone. Bloody sheep. 
To be honest with you, when I was researching this video, my head was fried. My brain went more gooey than the middle of a grilled cheese. The videos on the subject that I watched were bloody infuriating, expecting me to know what scientific terms meant. Do I look like the sort of guy who knows what scientific terms mean? But I pressed on. Because I knew that if I could boil this idea down to a digestible nugget, it would be useful and tasty for you. So you better bloody give this video a bloody like. Do it now! Our lives can be little more than a fantasy or a dream. When you're dreaming, you don't very often question that you're in a dream. You take it as red because it's not going to be much of a dream if you realise it's a dream. The purpose of dreams seems to be to get you to believe the images that are being conjured in front of you. I was actually rejected from my dream art school because I used the wrong pencil. It wasn't to be. I told my therapist about two dreams I had last week. On Monday, I dreamed I was a wigwam. On Tuesday, I dreamed I was a giant teepee. He said, you have to try and relax. It looks like you're too tense. Some people have peeked behind the curtain, so to speak. By taking mind-altering substances like DMT or magic mushrooms, people seem to be able to see the nature of reality for what it really is, apparently. And it would make sense for this reality to place these easter eggs inside the game to allow the player to see the world outside the world. I'm actually put off by doing DMT or ayahuasca or magic mushrooms because knowing my life, we're trapped in a room with James Corden for an eternity while he reads me his fudging memoirs or something. Reality appears to follow certain rules, you know, like gravity and physics and stuff. A video game only renders itself in the part that your character is actually in to save memory, don't it? That's why sometimes in video games, the mountains in the horizon pop into existence. Christ, imagine watching this video on shrooms. Make your ears fall off. And I might be wrong on some of the science. Because reading scientific papers was more painful than jumping off a trampoline into a load of barbed wire. Like this idiot in America. However, I like to think of life as an MMORPG video game. What does that mean? It means massively multiplayer, online, role-playing, video game. If you do accept that we're inside a simulation, the question still exists. Do you exist? Oh, I'm gonna have a bloody mental breakdown if I look at this any harder. So, do you exist? The answer is, I'm not sure. I think so. I don't know. As you can see, I'm clearly working at the edge of my intellectual powers on this You one. could exist the same way a protagonist does in a video game, thinking they have free will, when really you're being controlled by a higher power, a real player. Hopefully the alien kid who's running this simulation downloads the Wormhole DLC before I die so I can check out other alien planets and go and have a chat with some little alien fellas, find out what's been going on and that. Then when we collect enough XP points, as a human race, we get to unlock the other planet's DLC. But only one planet at a time. Mars first. We've already unlocked the moon. It's not very good. We get to unlock Mars next because of all the good XP points we got by adopting electric cars. So it's only fair that Elon goes first. When I put my hand in front of my face, it goes all blurry and pixelated. Like in a video game, when you get too close to something. Or it could just be that your eyes aren't good enough. I don't know, okay? This world and video games are already similar in the fact that pixels mirror atoms. Did you hear that joke about the two helium atoms? Hee <laughs> hee. Awful, awful joke. Here's your cheat code to life, by the way, to this video game that we call life. This is your prize for watching till the end. Now that you're panicking and having an existential crisis on the floor, I can see you. Don't worry, I had mine the other day. It doesn't really alter the way that we live our lives, because this is a human experience. Playing a video game of a human. Opting out or wishing it was different is like playing Grand Theft Auto, but wishing you were playing Angry Birds. That's not the game you're playing. Stop complaining about the world or the video game because you're powerless to bloody alter it. Unless you're a god, which I doubt because I'm the only god round here. What, you want to fight about it? What this allows you to do is live life reliably, pondering the nature of reality but not succumbing to it. And just get on with living playing your role as a human being in, in this video game that we call life and enjoy this ride as best you can. Oh, and uh, watch this next. What if a person who has ADHD is actually a real player inside this video game that we call life and everyone who doesn't have ADHD is actually an NPC? I know you're looking at me right now with a puzzled expression. Jack's lost his mother fudging mind. Let me show you your puzzled expression. See, you can see yourself, can't you? Well, some of you probably can. That was called a black mirror, which is ironic because this sounds like a lot of my theories, like it comes straight from the pages of the script book for the Black Mirror TV 
series because I'm about to tell you, lucky people, why I think there is a possibility that this world that we inhabit could contain NPCs. NPCs? What's that? NPCs means non-playable character, like in a video game. And this life that we actually live is a video game. It looks bloody real, doesn't it? And it feels extra real. But what is real? This... This isn't real. What is real? How do you define real? If you're talking about what you can feel, what you can smell, you can taste and see, then real is simply electrical signals interpreted by your brain. How do you define real? And how would you be able to tell the difference between what is real and what isn't? You're not special. You don't have divine knowledge and power to differentiate between the two, do you? I mean, I do, but you don't. You're just a normal human pleb, whereas me, I'm enlightened. So how can you tell me whether someone is real or not? How can you know that someone isn't a non-playable character? And so, like a motherfudging noir PI, I went on to investigate whether this simulation this metaverse that we live inside, this video game that we call life, contains NPCs. And if ADHD is the key to finding out the truth about this hyperactive theory, and you won't believe where it led me. In the UK, about 1.5 million adults have ADHD, they reckon, but only 120,000 are formally diagnosed. The population of the UK is 67.22 million, which means that if my theory is correct, that 2.2% of the UK UK's population are real players, meaning that 97.8% of the population are actually NPCs. That's more terrifying than a new movie starring James Corden, Ew! which is about as similar as when a member of the public tries to talk to me. Thank one of the biggest ways to establish whether somebody has ADHD or not is to ask them if they have an internal monologue. You know what I mean. Let me ask you this. When you wake up in the morning, does your brain instantly chime in with thoughts and chatter? Does that voice kick in as soon as you wake up? I'll tell you what mine does. I wake up, open my eyes, and instantly it starts jabbering. I wonder how Coldplay filmed that music video where they were singing backwards. It's ridiculous. I don't know how they did it. Perhaps they did it like, ooh, ooh, they could have done it a million different ways. Perhaps they learnt the song and did it backwards. It could be anything random like that. And then it chimes in with things I've got to do that day. You know, boring chores and whatnot. Or theories like this one. Or ideas like inventions. Like a see-through toaster or arguments with people that don't actually exist, or beating up a gang of youths against the odds. I only realised I had ADHD a matter of weeks ago. I mean, maybe it's obvious to you, but it wasn't to me. It's characterised with the following bullet points. One, carelessness and lack of attention to detail. Yep, I'm always rushing and making spelling mistakes, as you can tell from this YouTube channel. Continually starting new tasks before finishing old ones. This one is a major one for me. It's probably why I've had so many any jobs in my life. The other day I counted and I think it's approaching 30 because I just get bored with jobs and can't be bothered to do them. I also don't like people telling me what to do. When somebody tells me what to do, I end up going <laughs> and pissing off. And yes, I used to be bloody impulsive, which is probably why I'm still paying off the debts that I accrued for my 20s because I was constantly switching jobs, starting businesses, Starting this, starting that, starting a book, starting a YouTube channel, starting this, starting that, quitting it, moving on, next, 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 next. I need constant stimulation, poor organisational skills. That's why I always used to get sacked. Inability to focus and prioritise. Yet, yeah, I can't concentrate on anything for too long. Mind you, I have learned how to master this now and channel it into creative pursuits like this. Continually losing or misplacing things. Yeah, that reminds me, where the flip of my keys? Forgetfulness. I've got the worst memory in the bloody world. Memory like a sieve. I duh, lose me bollocks if they weren't attached to me leg. I can also barely remember what I did an hour ago. Restlessness and edginess. As you can tell, I'm always on edge. Difficulty keeping quiet and speaking out of turn. Yeah, that's because I find most people bloody insufferably boring. And when they ta start talking, it's like, oh my god. Shut the fuck up! Mood swings, irritability and quick temper. I'm better at this now because I channeled it into my creativity. But yeah, I can be flipping mood swingy. And if I can't do something, it tends to, you know, get th be thrown at the wall. Um, I've got through quite a few computers doing that. 
inability to deal with stress, pretty much. Extreme impatience. Yep, can't stand any bloody NPCs getting in my way. How do NPCs work? Well, for one, I don't think that they have an internal monologue. This has been proven recently on a dodgy study, and I think that they have pre-programmed speech, like AI system, that tells them what to say. Is this how an NPC speaks and acts? Have you ever wondered why, when you speak to somebody who you presume to be an NPC, you ask them about a theory, like, say, the simulation theory. They go quiet, and after a short while, change the subject. This is either because they're not comfortable with their worldview being changed, which I understand, or they're an NPC and cannot physically or mentally entertain the idea. Their mind diverts and tries to divert us at the same time. Bit like the Truman Show. It wants to keep you in the game and from realising that it is a game. What if the real player i.e. the player playing as you, the person above this reality and controlling you, that when it thinks, we feel those thoughts and your thoughts are their thoughts. That's what we sometimes call a gut feeling or maybe even intrusive thoughts. When I play a VR video game, I am playing through the character in front of me. But if technology progresses to the stage where we can upload our minds to the computer, then we can upload our mind into the character. Then when I think, it feels or thinks thinks those same thoughts. And what I've realised is, I get a better vibe from people that I think are real players. I don't get a good vibe from NPCs. I do get a good vibe from real players. So when you find another player who is part of the 2.2% club, you just know. You're like, oh my god, another real player, yay! But do NPCs even exist? Maybe. But I do think everyone is a main character in their own video game called Life. Everyone is a player. And at the same time, you're also an NPC in someone else's life. And what if NPCs aren't really NPCs? They're just plugged in and they haven't been awakened yet. It's like the Matrix. If you're still plugged in, you're part of the Matrix, as Morpheus explains, and you will fight to protect the Matrix or the simulation, thus diverting people who try and find out that it is a simulation. And once you're unplugged, there ain't no going back. And you can wake people up. Wake them up from being an NPC into an awakened one. You see, it's a bit like that film, Free Guy. He's an NPC inside a video game, but he wakes up and realizes that it is a video game and he's no longer an NPC. This world, it's a video game. You're not real. Or Neo in The Matrix. He is basically an NPC and he's asleep, but he wakes up and he starts searching for Morpheus and what The Matrix is. Then he's no longer trapped in the game. And to all the people who say, oh, you've got no scientific backing on these ideas. You're just saying the first thing that comes into your head. And it's like, yeah. And where do you think new ideas come from? Huh? By asking what if, what if, what if. That's what scientists do and coming up with plausible theories. I'm not saying this is evidently true. I'm exploring the possibility with you because imagine how it would change our world if just a little part of it was true. So, do you have ADHD? Are you part of the 2.2% club? Do you think it makes us a real player? Tell me below in the comments. It's really important that you watch this video next, which explains why we're living in a video game.